Uh, we work we work with communities to create innovative policy and financing solutions that provide affordable homes and better lives for the people of Massachusetts. And we do this through research, through our Center for Housing Data, the Community Assistance Team. We provide permanent financing for affordable rental housing. And we have a first time home buyer program, the One Mortgage Program. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn this over to the moderator for this session, Lisa Braxton, MHP's communication coordinator, to introduce the first speaker. Um, enjoy. Well, thank you, Katie, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session, How Land Use Regulations Affect Race and Class Segregation. Our speaker is Dr. Jessica Traunstein, Associate Professor of Political Science at University of California, Merced. She is the author of two books, Political Monopolies in American Cities, The Rise and Fall of Bosses and Reformers, and more recently, Segregation by Design, Local Politics and Inequality in American Cities, which has been described as one of the best books on urban politics in years. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Traunstein last week on Zoom and discussing her research. I found our talk provocative and eye-opening. Please welcome Dr. Traunstein. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm assuming that somebody will yell at me if it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. We're good to go? Yeah. Okay, excellent, great. So as Lisa said, um, I wrote a book uh, recently called Segregation by Design, Local Politics and Inequality in American Cities. And I'm gonna talk to you today about that research um, and gonna go back in history. But before I do that, I thought I would tell you a little bit about why I wrote this book. So uh, about 15 years ago, I got interested in the question about why some areas of the country or the city have access to good things like nice parks and well-paved roads and well-established police and fire forces <clears throat> and good schools. And why some areas of the country and of the city in which I was living did not have access to these things. And as I started digging around to try to find the answer to this question, it may seem obvious to all of you because you work in land use, but I discovered that the, the answer to that question about why there is inequality in access to the resources that governments provide is segregation. And so I thought, okay, well, I need to explain how segregation came to be. So I'll start way back in history in the 1960s. <laughs> and I got to the 1960s and I discovered that everything that happened in the 1960s had already been in place. And so I kept going back in time to try to figure out where this all began. And I finally got to the very beginning of sort of urban development in the United States, 1890, and that's where my story began. And so I'm gonna go through today a little bit of, of that history and hopefully by the end, you'll see how it connects to our land use policies and regulations today. In order to explain the story of the book, I worked with an artist and we developed together a comic. Um, a graphic novel um, that explains sort of how land use regulation plays this role. So I'm gonna go through the comic to start off our conversation here. So here we are, you can meet Tom and Jen, and Jen is pregnant with baby Katie, who's gonna make an appearance later in the comic, and they are shopping for a new home. They're looking in Camden, and probably to most of you, this um, is, a, is a city that resonates. It's a city that you've heard of. When I give talks like this in California, a lot of times people, people don't know the history of Camden, but I'm going to assume that people on, in this audience do. So Tom and Jen are shopping for a house in Camden, New Jersey, and they have a long list of priorities. And here you can sort of see in the zoom in here that what they want is a, an old house with charm that's been renovated. They want it to be near good schools for Katie, and they want it to be able to be commutable to Tom's work um, close by in Philadelphia. So they meet their uh, real estate agent, 
And she says, well, I'm going to try to do my best. Her name is Linda. So Linda shows Tom and Jen all of these different houses. They go from house to house. And each one, they like something about the house, but then they find a problem with the house too. So the first one is uh, the schools are not rated very well. And the next one, they can hear the freeway. Uh, in another, there's a lot of crime activity. So again and again, Jen and Tom get frustrated with their inability to find a house in the, in the place that they wanna live. And you should notice that the things that they're complaining about are not the houses themselves, but the neighborhoods in which the houses are located. So Linda suggests looking in nearby Cherry Hill instead. So they start to drive out to Cherry Hill and Tom asks, why is Cherry Hill so different? From Camden. He says, you can't help but notice that all of the Black community lives in Camden and all the white community lives in Cherry Hill. So what is this? Is this racism or is this just about economic differences that some people ha happen to have more money than others? Maybe this is just about what people want, right? Maybe some people want to live among communities and around people who demographically look like them. But research suggests that this isn't really right. Most people of color don't want to live in segregated communities. Most African Americans, uh, Latinos, and Asian Americans prefer to live in integrated communities, in fact. And their first choice would be, say, 50-50 people of color and, and whites. But they prefer largely not to live in overwhelmingly white neighborhoods. And this is going to come and play a role in the conversation as we move along here. But in general, whites support a much lower level of integration than people of color. And this is still true today. I recently ran a survey that demonstrates this very fact. White respondents on average prefer around 75% white neighbors. But let's back up. So Linda says, this isn't really about individuals' choices at all, about racism, about economics, but about politics. The fact that local governments institutionalized those racist attitudes a long, long time ago, building it into the design of cities themselves. And since the earliest days of the United States urban development, local governments have played a role in the process of segregation. They have influenced property values and strategically allocated public goods to the benefit of their most prominent political supporters, and that has been historically white property owners. As most of you know, local politics is at its core the politics of land use. And that politics has been dominated by a set of powerful players who have sought to increase and enhance their wealth and control the allocation of public goods like public education through the process of land use regulation, zoning, development, and redevelopment, local governments have and continue to reinforce segregation along race and class lines. And here in the comic, you can see just some of the ways in which the conversation around segregation has happened, right? They have to put a freeway somewhere. Where should it go? It should go in a neighborhood that is going to provide the least political resistance. That's the kind of conversation that the, that the comic tells. So I'm going to move away from the comic now and talk a little bit about how whites have kept people of color out of their communities. And many of you will know this history. Violence was historically a very effective means of keeping people of color out of white neighborhoods. And we've just had the anniversary of the Tulsa race riots, events like that where whites have perpetrated violence against communities of color have were very effective at demonstrating the color line, maintaining the color line. And to the extent that local governments did nothing to stop those attacks, to stop those riots, they participated in the generation of segregation. Restrictive covenants were another means of maintaining exclusivity. And you can see here up on the screen before you an example of a restrictive covenant. Of course, these are deeds that are, these are uh, private agreements that are written into the title of the house that assert or affirm that the owner will not sell to certain groups except for uh, help 
around the house. So the tenant agrees not to permit the premises to be used or occupied by any person other than members of the Caucasian race, but the employment and maintenance of other than Caucasian domestic servants shall be permitted. Right? That's a standard kind of language in a restrictive co covenant. Of course, the Supreme Court struck down restrictive covenants in 1948 um, in Shelley v. Kramer, but the practice continues. And even today, you can buy a house that has a restrictive covenant in the title. It's just that legally, that language is unenforceable by the government but they are sticky. And to the extent that we have these restrictive covenants in particular neighborhoods, in particular cities throughout the country, those neighborhoods have tended to remain whiter and more segregated even today. Racial steering is also quite common. Real estate agents refuse to show houses in white neighborhoods to buyers of color and uh, vice versa. That actually, uh, happened to me. I was shopping for a house when I was living on the East Coast. I hired a real estate agent and I kept finding these uh, condos that seemed to be right within my price range, but she was not showing them to me. And I finally asked her, why are you not showing me this housing? And she said, I wouldn't let my daughter live in those in that neighborhood and I'm not going to let you live there either. And I promptly found myself another real estate agent, but it was a, 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 a one person's example of maintaining segregation through these private actions. Of course, public actions can have these same sorts of effects. And what I'm showing you here is a map from Atlanta. So state and local policies can have the same consequences as restrictive covenants and racial steering. Several Southern cities established separate black and white neighborhoods in the early 1900s when zoning was a new thing on the scene. Cities hadn't really used this process of land use regulation much before the early 1900s. There are a few examples, but starting in the early 1900s, the process of zoning and land use regulation and planning really took off. So this is a map from Atlanta, um, and it's actually uh, from a little bit earlier than the 1920s. Somebody has written in the 1920s on this document, but, but it's earlier than that. And it's a little bit hard to see, but there are in this on this map designated zones where people of color were to live and designated zones where whites were to live. In 1917, the Supreme Court ruled this type of racial zoning, direct racial zoning, unconstitutional. And what happened in many cities, Atlanta was one of these, was they kept the maps exactly the same. They simply erased the word African-American or white from the particular zone. But what happened was that all of the planners, all of the zoners, all, everyone who was involved in the planning process knew which parts of the city were supposed to be designated for people of color and which parts of the city were supposed to be designated for white residents. And this tended to have the consequence of continuing the process of segregation. Cities also had other tricky mechanisms, and I like to use the, the example of Austin here. So city planners, city, uh, th those involved in the zoning process, often sought to enforce segregation, not directly because it was unconstitutional, but indirectly. So in the South, of course, schools were segregated. And one mechanism that cities often used was to locate the school that was to serve the students of color in the particular part of town where they wanted families of color to live. And then they assumed, and this actually happened, that the families of those students would want to move closer to the school. And so thereby creating a, a school area or a school zone that was predominantly inhabited by families of color. And Austin's uh, Black community was established in this exact way. But even without designating specific areas for the city <clears throat> that are to be inhabited by different demographics, cities can and do generate segregation using land use regulations. And this is where we get to the, the kinds of land use regulations that we see on the books today, specifying lot sizes, housing density, street widths, setbacks, height restrictions, all of these different aspects of land use regulation affect the cost of housing. And because the cost of housing is affected by land use regulations, they also affect who can afford to live in particular neighborhoods. 
Doing things like putting freeways or railroad tracks through certain neighborhoods lowers housing values, splits communities, physically separates neighborhoods, and can also reinforce segregation. These maps are probably familiar to many of you. They're the redlining maps from the Homeowners Loan Corporation. So the federal government generated policies that entrenched segregation. The Homeowners Loan Corporation was a New Deal program that was intended to spur um, construction employment and increase home ownership at the, at, at, to bring the country out of the depression. These maps are infamous for uh, implementing the process of redlining. So Hulk developed a system to evaluate the risk that was associated with lending in specific neighborhoods. They had four categories, and you can see the colors here. They had uh, red and yellow, blue and green. The almost all of the loans that were provided by the federal government, that were backed by the federal government, were provided in the lowest risk neighborhoods. Now, Recognize this is not the lowest risk uh, buyers of housing, but the lowest risk neighborhoods in which the buyers wanted to live. Areas that were racially homogenous, that had high proportions of whites, that had a strong sense of restrictive covenants, and that were zoned single family homes were more likely, overwhelmingly more likely, to be zoned blue and green. And neighborhoods that were populated by people of color, that had poorer communities, that had more immigrants, that had higher density housing and lower quality housing stock were overwhelmingly graded red and yellow. And because these loans were provided at such a low cost, essentially the federal government subsidized home buying in whiter wealthier neighborhoods and did not subsidize home buying in neighborhoods of color. As the history of Atlanta suggests that I just presented, Holt didn't invent these standards of racial worth, right? The federal government didn't come out of thin air and say, this is the neighborhood that is going to be coded green or, or blue. They built on what was already in existence, but building on what was already in existence legitimized the practice of segregation. It bureaucratized the practice of segregation. It lent power, prestige, and the support of the federal government to the systematic policies of racial exclusion. These federal redlining policies were in place as suburbs ex exploded with population in the post-World War II period. Along with the fact that race and income are highly correlated in the United States, this meant that early suburbs were much whiter and much wealthier than the central cities that they surrounded. This would change over time. Everyone on this Zoom call can think of a suburb that is predominantly populated by people of color. And many of our inner ring suburbs in particular have become much more integrated over time. But there remain places that are overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly wealthy and overwhelmingly exclusive. So where does this leave us? This leaves us with two patterns of segregation in the United States a history that led to neighborhoods segregated by race and class, and more recently, whole cities divided by race and class. I'm gonna show you some maps to help crystallize this concept. This is a map of Camden, New Jersey in 1940. And if any of you know the history of Camden, New Jersey, in 1940, Camden was a city that was on the rise still. It was a city that was uh, poised to be uh, a leader on the East Coast. What I'm showing you in this map is the racial makeup of the census tracts in Camden in 1940. And you can see that there are some census tracts that are overwhelmingly dominated by African American families. There are other census tracts that are overwhelmingly dominated by white families, right? So we have segregation here in Camden. This is a good map of segregation that has occurred within a city. Here is 1970, and now I've zoomed out to show you both Camden and Cherry Hill. And what you can see here is that Cherry Hill is overwhelmingly populated with white residents, and Camden has many more black residents than it did in 1940. 
But what I want you to notice here in this map of Camden are these two neighborhoods here at the top and at the bottom of the city that are still overwhelmingly white. Camden had some very white neighborhoods even as of 1970. Here in 2011, those white neighborhoods in Camden have disappeared. Camden has become an overwhelmingly black city and Cherry Hill has integrated, right? Cherry Hill is no longer as white as it once was, but it is still much whiter than Camden is. So what these maps have shown you are the two types of segregation, segregation that occurs within a city and then segregation that occurs between cities. Why am I making this point? I am making this point because these two types of segregation persist and they have different policy responses that are required. Here, for your enjoyment, is a racial dot map of the Boston area. I was not able to get the city boundaries to be drawn into this map because, um, because I wasn't. <laughs> I tried, but I couldn't get it to, to work. You all know, you all know where your cities are. Um, I know that this is just the zoomed in part and many of you are from, are from outer lying areas. But you can see here what this is showing you. Each dot in this map is a person from the 2010 census. And the white, uh, the blue dots are white residents, the green dots are black residents, red dots are Asian residents, and the orangey yellow dots are Latinx residents. The, there are brown dots that represent other groups, but they're pretty hard to see on, on this map. And you can see that this map is showing us both types of segregation. We have segregation within the city of Boston, and we have segregation between Boston and its surrounding cities. Today, our land use regulations continue to reinforce segregation. I mentioned some of these before, but policies like minimum lot sizes, restrictions on density, multifamily housing, growth controls, even open space preservation, high fees for builders, cumbersome review processes, uh, processes that invite public response, all work to codify earlier patterns of racial and ethnic economic segregation by preventing change. That's how this works. When land use regulations stick in time, what existed before, they stick in time, the segregation that was built over the hundred year history of the United States. While the nation diversifies and our inequality becomes ever greater, these patterns remain in place. I'm going to show you a few more maps just to make the point really clear. This is a racial dot map of a northern city in the very far north of the Bay Area. It's called Petaluma. Um, Petaluma was uh, initially, uh, a long time ago, a sundown town. They prohibited African-American, Latinx, and Asian families from moving into Petaluma at all. And we can see some of that uh, historical legacy here. Petaluma is a very white and very sparsely populated city. So the, one of the nice things about these racial dot maps is that they show you density as well as racial makeup. So as the dots are spread out, we can see that the population is less dense. What I want you to notice here is that the city is overwhelmingly white, but there are some neighborhoods like this little one here in the center and this little one here in the right hand corner that are overwhelmingly Latino. Here is a picture, a, a, a map, a satellite image of the land use in this same city. I'll go back and forth just for one second. Okay, here's our racial dot map and here's our land use map. What I wanna point out are things like this. You see this small concentration of high density apartments that matches up to this high density population of Latino families. And again, you can see here the land use out in the outer lying areas, these very, very large agriculturally sized lots that are very sparsely populated and the land use maps fairly well onto the racial makeup of the community. This is an example of land use segregation, land use segregation and racial segregation within a single city of Petaluma. Here is an example of racial segregation between cities. So here we have in the upper right hand corner here, the city of East Palo Alto. And then on the bottom half here, we have cities of Atherton, Menlo Park and Palo Alto. 
The city of East Palo Alto was historically the only community that was open to African American residents in the Silicon Valley at all. All of the other surrounding cities had a strong trend of restrictive covenants. In recent decades, it has become predominantly Latinx working class households with many families living in dense apartment buildings. And you can see the concentration of yellow dots in East Palo Alto, which represent these households. The city, uh, cities of Menlo Park, Palo Alto and Atherton immediately adjacent look very different, right? They're predominantly white and the households are much densely concentrated as represented by the spaced out blue dots. Here is the land use map of this same area. What I want you to pay attention to is this very stark line. This is a creek that runs between East Palo Alto and Palo Alto. Look at the greenery in Palo Alto. Look at the almost industrial looking form, land use form, oops, sorry, of East Palo Alto. There are many more dense apartment complexes. There is a freeway that is running through the city just as you cross the border, the landscape instantly switches to single family homes with no apartment buildings. This change in land use is what signals the change in demographics from Latinx and working class to white and wealthy. Residents in racially exclusive places like Palo Alto, Menlo Park and Atherton have come to expect that their land use regulations will protect and preserve the kind of community in which they live. And they have come to expect that racial segregation and inequality is simply a byproduct of, the, of meritocracy. And they conflate white exclusivity with high property values. I'll just add a little note here that whites are willing to pay a premium on housing to live in racially exclusive communities. And this is another way in which segregation is perpetuated by land use regulations that affect the cost of housing. Dr. Trounstein? Yes. Yeah, probably another minute or so. Sounds go. good, I'm wrapping up. Okay. So what are the consequences and what are the solutions? Well, segregation generates inequalities between race and class groups because in a world of scarce resources, the politically powerful deny public goods to those who are politically weak. Segregation across city lines has meant that the benefits experienced by racial and ethnic minorities and low income individuals are inferior to the benefits experienced by whites and the wealthy. For example, segregated places have more sewer overflows. In metro areas where segregation persists, we see vast inequalities in everything from schools to safe streets to drinking water. The situation is not immutable, but it is difficult to address. And the first step toward policy solutions is to recognize really and truly in our hearts to understand that segregation is purposeful. It is not accidental. The geography of our communities did not happen accidentally. And the people who create segregation, maintain segregation and benefit from segregation are always those who are most opposed to undoing it. But un undoing it is possible. One of the most important policy levers that we have is to integrate our housing stock and to prevent exclusive neighborhoods and cities from remaining off limits to lower income families. Lower income residents could also be, of course, given housing subsidies to allow them to move and to make different choices. At the same time, we must be careful not to push new housing only into marginalized neighborhoods that have few options at the lower end of the income distribution. Garnering support for this kind of policy change will require tremendous political pressure from both marginalized groups and their allies, and it's an admittedly daunting task. Advocacy groups, citizens, organizations, and concerned policymakers must work to build coalitions for a more just and equitable desegregated society because our future success depends upon it. Well, thank you, Dr. Traunstein. As you were talking, one question that occurred to me is, where do affordable housing advocates fit into this, this effort, the efforts you just touched on toward the end? What can affordable housing advocates do to challenge the, the, um, the land use regulations? Well, affordable housing advocates can, if we're talking about, and this is um, where understanding the kind of segregation that we're addressing is important. If you are an affordable housing advocate that is trying to 
build and maintain or create affordable housing within a city that has um, segregation within the city lines, then you go to the city council, to the planning commission, you advocate to that community. If you are interested in solving the problem of segregation across city lines, the only avenue is to go to regional entities or to the state government, right? So you have to find the right audience for your, uh, for your policy leverage. And one question we did have uh, from an attendee, how do these, the histories and policies you mentioned translate to a rural context like towns of Lower and Outer Cape Cod, for instance? So I don't, I don't know about the, the rural nature of Massachusetts, but I know about the rural nature of California. And it turns out that rural areas have segregation too. It just happens to be more spread out, right? And so uh, we here in Merced are segregated by the railroad tracks and also a creek very heavily. And uh, so even though our lot sizes are much bigger than many of the lot sizes in the more densely populated areas of the Bay Area or Los Angeles, we continue to have marginalized neighborhoods within our more rural community. And uh, there's an, a, another piece of this, and I'm not sure, I probably this doesn't uh, reflect the, the, the nature of, of um, the, the population patterns in Massachusetts, but we can also have regional segregation. So the Central Valley in California is much more heavily dominated by people of color and it is much poorer than our coast, right? So that's another, it's even a separate layer of segregation. And so what we need is for all of the more exclusive communities, be they neighborhood, be they city, be they region, to be more inclusive and welcoming of the demographic diversity of our nation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Traunstein. I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Katie. Yeah, I hate, I hate to wrap this up, but I want to thank you so much for coming. And um, we have a little, like a, now at this point, a 10 minute break scheduled to the next session. Um, again, I just want to thank you so much for coming. It was just terrific. And this will be recorded and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of requests for it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If everyone else could just, you're welcome to stay. You can take a little break. There's going to be a... Um, some slides and then a poll question and we will reconvene at 1.45. Thank you. Um, we are running just about on time. And for the next session, we have um, two speakers that I'm very happy to have here. Karina Milchman Oliver, AICP, who's the Chief of Housing and Neighborhood Development at Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Hi and Chris Kletchman, who is the Deputy Director of Community Services Division at Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development. So I'm gonna just turn it over. I'm not sure which of you is speaking first, um, but this is about expanding housing choice, which I know a lot of you have come to hear about. So why don't you two guys just take it away um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, and uh, thanks to everybody who's here. What an interesting presentation by Dr. Traunstein. Um, always interesting to hear her. Uh, again, my name is Chris Klutchman. I'm the Deputy Director at the Division of Community Services at DHCD. Um, I have been working on the Housing Choice Program for the last three and a half years, uh, both the program that designates communities and provides grants for communities that are producing housing in Massachusetts, as well as obviously working on the legislation um, the Baker Polito administration has proposed three years ago um, and that we're, you're gonna hear about today. Um, my uh, partner in crime here is Karina Oliver Milchman and Karina uh, is going to take the, is gonna share her screen and she's gonna start the presentation. All right, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Katie. It's really great to be here today. Um, bear with me while I share my screen and make sure it's the right screen. I got a couple different ones going on now. Let's see. All right, can people see that? Can someone give me a thumbs up? All right, great. So um, I'm Karina Oliver Milchman. I'm Chief of Housing and Neighborhood Development at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. That's the regional planning agency for Greater Boston. We serve 101 cities and towns, uh, mostly within 495. And our, uh, we're 
committed to smart growth and regional collaboration, my team specifically works on expanding housing opportunity, diversity, and affordability in the region. So I'm excited to talk with you all today. So we're going to start uh, just by talking about housing diversity. What does it mean? Um, and I mean it to mean a range of housing options available to a range of people that have all different unique housing needs and wants. And so why does it matter? Well, housing diversity um, not just creates more inclusive communities by serving a broader range of people. Um, there are other benefits as well. Uh, it means that there are a broader range of homes at different price points, which frees up people's um, discretionary spending to support local businesses, um, which also allows employers to have an easier time recruiting employees. Um, it's often uh, in more walkable um, areas, certainly when there's a broader range of housing choices within a given community, it means that the people who work and serve that community can also live within the community, which cuts down on commutes and um, greenhouse gas emissions and is overall better for the environment. And it also improves public health because when people have housing that works for them, uh, whether it's accessible or newer and lead free, um, they have more funds available to take care of themselves because they're not taking care of homes that don't work for them. So while housing diversity is great, as I just tried to point out, it's also really limited in Massachusetts. And this is a screenshot of MAPC Zoning Atlas, which is a relatively new research project that our data services department did. It establishes a regional zoning standard so that we can compare zoning across our 101 cities and towns. I know it's a little small, but this map shows multifamily housing defined as two or more units in yellow. Darker yellow means it's allowed by right for the zoning and paler means it's allowed by right in, uh, sorry, by special permit. The light brown color, which is pretty much the dominant color, means that there's no multifamily housing allowed in those areas whatsoever. So AKA, those areas are zoned exclusively for single family homes. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Amy Dane's research, the state of multifamily housing, similar findings, very little land zoned for multifamily housing, and oftentimes even the land that is zoned for multifamily, the land here in yellow, um, is very restricted uh, in terms of density, setbacks, heights, et cetera. Um, and also really cumbersome permitting processes that make the development process uncertain. And time is money for developers. So it also makes it harder to produce lower cost housing. Um, so zoning isn't the only factor that limits who can call places home, but it's definitely a big one. And we can see it when we look at race and ethnicity across the region. Um, given how restrictive the zoning is, it's not surprising that Greater Boston is also ethnically and racial, racially pretty segregated. And you can see there's more diversity in the inner core, although even at the neighborhood level, it tends to be more segregated. But as you go further and further out into the suburbs, it becomes just predominantly white. And that, you know, coincides with a reduction in housing choices and multifamily housing specifically. So how did we get here? It's by design, as we heard in the last session. So I don't wanna um, dwell too much on this, but much of our modern municipal zoning was created after the US Supreme Court struck down government-backed residential segregation in 1917. And while the court found that explicit laws preventing primarily black citizens from purchasing property in predominantly white neighborhoods was unconstitutional, the following decades would see the rise of a new set of policies that would effectively sustain racial as well as economic segregation in our communities. And while these policies are no longer in place, it's really hard to undo their impacts, particularly given the state of contemporary zoning or the zoning, historic zoning that is still in place in many of our communities, which hasn't been updated. Um, so there are many strategies we can use to uh, reverse these patterns and foster more inclusive communities, but one very powerful tool is zoning. And I really love this quote from Boston City Councilor 
Lydia Edwards, we interviewed her last month for a video on the seaport, and she said that zoning is the most effective way to segregate and discriminate. So we took zoning to be the most effective way to do just the opposite. She was talking about the new fair housing requirements in the zoning code of Boston, but I think it also applies just as well to zoning for a broader range of housing or preventing a broader range of housing. So we all know per that map I started with that land can be zoned just for single family. It can also be zoned for multifamily, but it can be zoned for a very broad range of housing types in between. Um, this is a housing type database that MAPC is building out right now, 3D models of a range of housing types. This is just a sample. You can see they start you know, with the lower, lower end of the density spectrum with single family housing and ADUs and goes all the way up to high rise multifamily with park, uh, structured parking, many different kinds in between, including you know, two, three family townhomes, cottage clusters, um, and you know, apartment or condo buildings at a range of densities. So we know we need so much housing across the region and the Commonwealth to meet need and demand, but we also know from our own experience planning and zoning that we have to think sensitively about where it goes. So I wanted to just pause and ask all of you where you think housing should be built, new housing, and you can select all that applies. Um, I also think you should be able to um, add in your own ideas. So is this working for people? I'm going to just scroll down and see if I can see some heads nodding. It should be activated. I'm going to leave it open for a minute. And let's see. Here we go. All right, so it is working because at least one person has done it. And so far we have commercial corridors identified. All right, existing residential areas, great. Keep them coming. A lot of support for city and village centers, which makes for a nice segue as Chris and I continue into this presentation. Is it up just a couple seconds longer? Looks like responses are still flowing in. Curious what other ideas people have. If you're putting other, please feel free to share what those ideas are in the chat and we'll take a look at it as we continue. All right, so not much interest in office parks and industrial areas, some interest in adding new housing to established residential areas, certainly city, town, village centers, and a little bit of interest in commercial corridors. We'll move on now, because that is a good segue. So continuing on this theme of where should new housing be built, you know, smart growth is a pretty popular idea, and certainly it looks like you all are um, supportive of it and based on the responses of city and town village centers for new housing. Um, I think, you know, the predominant idea of smart growth is that it's connected development. Maybe it's connected to transit, to retail, to amenities, to services, to existed, existing infrastructure. It's about both taking advantage of what's already there in an area, but also um, driving uh, people to take advantage of what's there, um, either as residents, who can live there or support local businesses or ride the train. A lot of communities, you know, have um, transit ridership down. So uh, certainly TOD smart growth can help with that. And if we compare it to the opposite of smart growth, so we're all probably familiar with Towers in the Park, with Berzier's idea back in the 1920s, um, which was to build things, set back from the sidewalk in their own little bubble, so to speak, but with a lot of green space around the structures um, and uh, kind of an uh, established bucolic community. But what we see today is that edge development, as Amy Dane calls it, not so much motivated by urban, urban planning philosophy, more motivated by the fact that um, 
there's a lot of opposition to adding housing in established areas of communities, particularly residential areas, which is what most of the land in our region is zoned for, residential. So we see them cropping up, you know, it's not so much towers in the park as towers in the parking lot or low scale development in the parking lot, um, but they're isolated and they tend to be really auto dependent. And um, this is not where I should, would say housing should be built. So when we think about what kinds of housing make sense where, I think about two big factors. One is understanding the context, right? So what are the existing land uses? What's the built environment like? What kind of roadway types? Um, but also not just the context, but the parcel itself. What are its characteristics? How big is it? What can it support? Um, how, what kind of development makes sense on that scale parcel? And then the other factor would be understanding people. So who lives there? Who's demanding or in need of housing there? Um, what kind of price point works for them? what kind of configuration or degree of accessibility is needed and so forth. So this is just to illustrate how uh, MAPC has approached this question in one of our planning processes is a map of Lynn. We started by looking at uh, the full suite of housing types that we developed and thinking about which ones were most in need or most in demand based on the population. But to take a more place-based approach, we first started by establishing different place types. So you can see the, yellow, the pale yellow here is uh, lower density neighborhoods. The orange is middle, you know, mid-size, mid-density neighborhoods. Pink is downtown and uh, blue is waterfront. So those were kind of the place types. Uh, oh, and sorry, red is um, major commercial corridors. And then we established site types on top of that. So drilling down further, more granular way um, so small type sites in the downtown, mid-size and median density, et cetera, and then matching those site types to housing types. And these are just a sample. There were many, site, uh, many housing types that worked for many different place types. So one last point I'll make here, which is why is it so hard to create the kind of housing diversity communities wanna see? And Certainly one major factor is that land and development costs um, are, are super high. And so it's hard from a developer's perspective to build a full range of housing, certainly um, more kind of missing middle mid-scale housing that the economics of which might not make sense with really high construction and land costs. But the other piece of the puzzle that contributes to those high costs is zoning, right? So both zoning that restricts density but also unpredictable permitting processes. We've talked about time being money, but also the unpredictability empowering um, a small vocal minority to thwart development. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Kletchman because she's gonna talk about housing choice and the ways in which hopefully it uh, addresses some of these challenges and barriers. And Chris, I'll advance slides for you. Thank you, Karina. And I think yeah, go ahead, Karina. I was just gonna say, give me one moment to activate the next poll question, please. So Karina, people were saying that they could only choose one answer. So um, shall we have them um, in this poll, if that is the case, why don't you give us the highest density zoning that your zoning allows in your community, if, if that's the case. Is that okay, Karina? Yep, that sounds great. And it is activated now, it should be activated. So highest density allowed in your zoning ordinance or bylaw, sounds good. And just to um, continue along the graph, the graphic that Karina had in the last slide, you know, not only the land costs are high and construction costs are high, um, but the unpredictability of the permitting process adds time. And time means that the people who are trying to do development, whether you're a community development corporation who's doing affordable housing or you're a for-profit developer, you have to pay carrying costs while you are holding on to the property. You might have to pay an option to the current property owner. You might be paying taxes if you own the land. And all of those carrying costs add to the costs. Um, and that is 
exacerbated by that unpredictable planning process where you don't know if you're going to be able to rezone your property or you don't know if the special permit is going to be approved or you have a very lengthy special permit process. And so that's part of the problem with uh, uh, zoning is the time frame. Does look like a majority of people so far just have single family. That's not a surprise, I think, to Karina and I. Again, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the zoning atlas that Karina talked about, um, which is for the MAPC region, um, so just this, uh, the greater Boston region, um, is a very useful tool. Uh, if you don't uh, know what a community zoning or you want to do some of your own research about zoning in not only your community, but maybe adjacent communities that you might compare your community to. Karina? This is Katie Lacey. I'm just jumping in real quick because there was a question. Do you mean by right or by special permit? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, for the purposes of this poll, what do you think, Chris? I, I would be interested either way, really, because I, yeah, think, I think we should probably be inclusive by yeah. either way. I, I think, you know, so by, by either by either method, just just the den. I think what we're really looking for is just the density metric, mm -hmm. not the process. That's pretty much what I would have expected, Karina. What do you think? Yeah, I, I feel similarly. Um, I, I think it, I do often see that more communities allow mixed use than, than higher density multifamily without the commercial. Uh, so this, this certainly supports that. And I think it'd be a whole nother session, but it'd be interesting to understand kind of what are the drivers of that as well. So Chris, if you just let me know when you want me to. Sure, let's go, why don't we start the, yeah, why don't we start the housing choice section? So as you uh, may know, um, the governor signed the economic development bond bill uh, in January of this year after three years of uh, advocacy by not only the Baker Polito administration, but um, uh, allies like uh, CHAPA and MAPC, uh, the home builders, the Mass Municipal Association, a real, uh, a group of a coalition of um, advocates on all sides of this um, discussion, all of whom agreed that housing production was a problem in Massachusetts, that we just have not been producing enough housing and that was one of the major factors in driving up housing costs and making these housing options that we're talking about um, more uh, more difficult. Can you go back, Karina, to the, um, thank you. So- uh, Sorry the, about that. No, no problem. The major thrust of the legislation that was passed uh, is to take for certain zoning amendment types that promote housing to allow those to be approved, um, whether it's by a town meeting or by a city council or a town council, by a simple majority. So 50% plus one, rather than that two thirds, 67% that can be very difficult to achieve, again, at either, you know, whatever legislative body um, that you have. So uh, that is in effect now, um, it, uh, the governor signed it and it became effective immediately. It applies to all cities and towns throughout Massachusetts, except Boston. Boston has its own zoning statute, so it is not included here. And just to be clear for folks, um, there is no opt-in. It just apply, it changed chapter 40A and it changed the way that um, zoning amendment votes are to be held from now on for 350 communities in Massachusetts. Um, we know that local governments control the zoning and have to approve zoning amendments. And so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to make this available for the communities that want to adopt uh, good zoning like 40R uh, smart growth, starter homes, ADUs, um, increase your density to, to get to that high housing diversity that we're talking about here. Um, we, for communities that wanna do that, we wanted to make it as a majority, a simple majority that would do that instead of that um, super majority. Let's go to the next one. 
So I am going to go over and you will have this presentation in your binder um, so you don't need to scramble with notes, but I just want to make sure that everybody has a basic understanding of what um, the major components of this legislation did to change or reform Chapter 40 are. I should have said that um, this is the first major reform of Chapter 40A uh, in the uh, 25 years, so we're very excited to, to have it. So um, the kinds of zoning that qualify for simple majority are zoning that would change to allow multifamily or mixed use by right. And we have a concept of eligible location, which is very similar to the concepts of smart growth that Karina went over earlier. Those are areas of concentrated development, areas that are served by uh, public services like sewer and water, uh, or are able to be served by water or sewer. Um, uh, town centers, village centers, downtowns, um, those are all examples of eligible locations. Um, if you're permitting accessory dwelling units by right or open space residential development subdivisions by right, those are often done by special permit. So any, of, any amendment to your zoning that would do those would qualify for that simple majority. Recognizing that special permits are also an important part of um, zoning in Massachusetts. Um, if you're doing multifamily and mixed use by special permit, uh, it's also um, eligible. Accessory dwelling units that are detached by special permit. If you're increasing the number of units on a property by special permit, which is somebody that uh, something that many communities allow. Um, if you're reducing parking requirements for residential or mixed use development. Um, also, if you're changing your dimensional standards to add, allow for additional units, so you're taking an acre zoning and saying that instead of needing one acre per house, you need a half acre, for example, that would be an example of a zoning change that would qualify for simple amendment. If you're doing a Chapter 40R smart growth or starter home district, those are simple, those are by simple majority. And if you're doing natural resource protective, protection zoning or transfer of development rights. Next. The legislation also had a couple other things that didn't apply to voting thresholds. And I just wanna mention them here uh, just so, so that you understand that they're available. Um, there's an ab ability to have um, two municipalities that are adjacent to each other, share the revenue from a property that is developing in one of those uh, one of the communities, but let's say there is an impact to another community. So um, a development where all the traffic goes through one community, but the revenue goes to the other. So sometimes governments want to share those revenues. And in the past, you had to do that by a home rule petition or a series of home rule petitions. And this now allows that to happen. Uh, there's also a provision to try and prevent frivolous appeals that allows the court, if there is an appeal of uh, um, a project, that um, if the court finds that there's harm to the community or to the public uh, that, is out, um, that outweighs the harm to the plaintiff, they can require a higher, higher bond amount to make it a little more difficult to appeal what are often controversial um, up zones, for example. Next slide. And perhaps some of the most um, uh, significant change to the Chapter 40A is a new section. It's now Section 3A in Chapter 40A that requires if you're in an MBTA community that you must have a multifamily zoning district that allows multifamily by right at at least 15 units per acre. Now, um, this section has a fair amount of discretion in it, and we have the agency I work for, Department of Housing and Community Development, and our secretariat, uh, the Economic Office of Housing and Economic Development, are charged with developing guidance to help communities understand what does reasonable size mean, how are you going to measure density, um, how is this really going to be affected, and what the timing is. The, this is um, a provision that it, it's not mandatory, but if you do not um, comply with the provisions once the guidance is issued, you will not be eligible for certain capital grants, such as the housing choice grants, mass work infrastructure grants, or local capital project funds. So while it's not mandatory, um, there is certainly an impact to a community that would not um, adopt this. And I will just say we are currently working on this uh, guidance and we hope to have draft guidance out um, later this summer. Next slide. So for those of you who don't know if you're an MBTA community or not, this is a map of all of the MBTA communities. 
Um, it does not apply to Boston. So Boston is excluded, although it is technically, you know, as served by MBTA, of course, but that's because Boston is not, as I said earlier, it's not, um, uh, does not have to comply with chapter 40A. And this is a rule that's in chapter 40A. So Boston, it does not apply to them. Uh, so all of the communities here in yellow are MBTA communities. Um, again, we will be issuing guidance for this section later this summer and also conducting outreach. Um, both we are currently having a stakeholder process. We'll be posting draft guidance and looking for comments. Uh, and we'll be working with all of these communities to make sure that they understand the requirements and that there's a reasonable timeline for you to comply. Next slide. So I just, uh, I, uh, and I want to credit Amy Dane. Um, Amy and I had a conversation where I wanted to show some pictures of um, what zoning at 15 units an acre looks like in communities around uh, that are uh, in the MBTA communities. And I just wanted to start giving people an idea that 15 units an acre is not a skyscraper. Uh, it is, you know, development at this, uh, at this scale, as you can see here in these slides. Um, uh, some of these are from Lexington, Norfolk, Acton, and um, I'm forgetting the last one. <laughs> but anyway, so some of our suburban communities that have built at densities, uh, some of these are in town centers. As you can see, they actually are incorporating mixed use, um, and some of them are just outright townhouses. So um, I think that 15 units an acre is really, uh, again, for many of our communities that are the MBTA communities, they may never have really contemplated multifamily zoning at this scale, but I wanted to be clear that 15 units an acre is not, uh, should not be scary to folks. Thanks, Karina. Sure thing. Okay, so this is, this is a good segue because now we're gonna take a look at some um, examples of housing diversity throughout the Commonwealth, um, broken up by some of the housing types that are eligible for simple majority now under housing choice. And we'll go from lowest density to higher density um, and certainly hit on 12 units an acre. So we can circle back to that uh, MBTA community um, provision in 40A now. So we'll start with accessory dwelling units. Uh, these are AKA granny flats or AKA in-law units. They, they come by lots of different names. There are predominantly two types. One is attached. And so that can be a space carved out um, or conversion of an existing living area in a primary dwelling unit or finishing an existing basement or attic in a primary dwelling unit. Or there are the detached variety and those can be in addition to the existing structure like an attached garage or sorry, like a detached garage or a new freestanding structure. And so there are a lot of examples of ADUs across the Commonwealth. Many of them are grandfathered in because a lot of communities are not zoning for this yet, although there are quite a few that are like Salem, Barnstable, Cambridge, Lexington, Newton, Orleans, and Wellfleet, uh, to name a few. Um, but really the future of what these look like, I think will depend largely on how a given community writes ADU zoning. Uh, so this is an example of one in Jamaica Plain. It's got a little bit more of a modern vibe. It's detached. Here we have some options in Newbury. Um, you know, you see the garage on the left, that could be an ADU above it, or you see this little addition on the right. Uh, these are two separate buildings here. And this is uh, another example of a garage uh, carve out ADU on the right in Lexington. Um, so this is a, this is a pretty bucolic uh, site. I've driven by it several times, it's beautiful. Um, and yet they've, they've added density by creating this uh, accessory dwelling unit. So cottage cluster will be the next type we touch on. These are pedestrian friendly collections of smaller homes. Um, the homes themselves can take many different forms. They could be apartment buildings, they could be single family homes, they can be townhouses. They often have a shared green space and detached common parking. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to Chris because she's most familiar with the examples we're gonna share here. Thanks, Karina. 
So cottage developments um, have become, uh, you, you, you probably have heard of them. Um, they kind of caught people's uh, eyes and attention. Um, I'm gonna talk about this example in Westford. Um, this was uh, where, where I was the community development director. Now, I, this had already been in place before I got there. So I have no credit here other than issuing the permits for it. Um, this was a, a town owned site um, that was given, uh, the town wanted to um, promote affordable housing. And so they did an RFP for a developer to um, develop affordable housing on this site. And the developer that submitted the successful proposal had these small cottage units. I think they're about 700 to 1100 square feet each. Uh, they worked um, to do a, as you can see on the illustration, there's kind of a town green that the um, cottages collect around. That's actually where the septic system is because Westford does not have um, much sewer. And so this is um, a project that is developed on sewer and that community green, which is a flat space for baseball and kickball games uh, is also the leach field. Um, let's go to the next slide. So as you can see, these are fairly modest units. Um, the parking is in the back. Uh, and so there, again, this is a picture of that green, which also provides recreation area. These are all 20 units in this development are affordable at 80% of the area median income. Uh, and it has um, been a, a successful um, use of this property. Here's another example of that. So, um, so again, I think with cottages, um, sometimes the uh, attention to the design and the layout is important. It's really a community. You know, as you can see, those uh, cottages are we're, in Westford, we're fairly close together. Uh, okay, now let's go on to uh, West Newberry. So this is the river's edge development. Um, and these, this is a really interesting um, type of development because what West Newberry did is in their open space residential development guidelines, um, which so open space residential development allows for um, development developers to maybe have uh, lots that are a little bit um, smaller, um, but protect open space. And so there's typically a, uh, an allowance for flexibility while you're providing public benefits. So often the public benefit is open space. But in West Newbury back in 2013, they decided to add a couple other benefits and they allowed for density bonuses if you did certain things. So they had a density bonus if you did historic preservation. They also added a density bonus if you limited the size of the housing. And so this development um, was done under that provision. Um, not counting the garages, um, there is an lim overall limitation on the size of these units. Um, I think it's somewhere around 2,000 square feet. Um, but that's a deed restriction that applies to these houses. So the developer got to build extra housing units um, because of the density bonus provision, but also agreed and the people who, and this sold out immediately as my understanding, um, that these will always be relatively small houses. So this was not a McMansion um, style development. It's one where the, um, the housing is, is limited in size. And I think this is a really innovative way to um, protect uh, uh, moderate, level, moderate housing costs over time. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So here's just some more images. As you can see, these are, um, you know, what, one of the things that we're missing is this modest scale housing. And so this was um, as part of their, um, their process. And again, the density bonus, I think, is really what drew the developer to this, uh, to this size. But you know, clearly um, there's a market for this modest size housing, which also means that the pricing was gonna be more moderate. Uh, the last example is from Sherburn. Again, as you can see, um, these, develop, these cottage developments seem, uh, you know, not, not always, but they often have uh, this kind of community feel where there's shared open space, um, shared greens. I, I, I don't know if this is within Sherburn's um, sewer system, but it also may be on septic. And so again, some of these open spaces that are flat and level are hiding leaching fields underneath them. So just because you don't have public sewer does not mean that you can't do um, this mod moderate level of density that's here in these cottage developments. Next. And again, just a very attractive development. Thanks, Karina. Thank you. Yeah, this one's interesting because it is, um, you know, attached housing. And so cottage cluster doesn't always have to be detached single family. These are actually townhomes, which is a nice segue to our next housing type. 
Um, so townhomes are smaller side-by-side -side attached homes, usually multi-level with their own private entrance. There's no common space like in a condo building, for example, where there's um, hallways and other inter shared interior spaces. And they typically face a street or a cart courtyard like we just saw here in Sherburne. Um, so I'll go through a couple of examples. This is in um, Roxbury. It's uh, an award-winning project, I believe it's, um, oh, you know, I think I'm making some notes here, um, but it's small, it's only four units. Um, and they all have their own private green space. They have shared parking um, and they were designed, uh, I think this is a lead project and they were designed to take advantage of the orientation here uh, for solar panels. Um, and you can see they offer, they offer a nice amount of privacy to the occupants. They also fit in well um, to the surrounding you know, building scale, these footprints. They're a little smaller overall you know, clustered together, they're not that dominant. This is an example in uh, Weymouth, Massachusetts, also townhomes. So obviously very different scale, different architectural style. Um, and uh, this is uh, much more dense housing. Um, can we bear with me for a second? My notes got a little out of order. Um, so these are, uh, let's see, I think I have some other examples here. Yeah, okay, so in Stoughton, again, now we have, uh, I think these are, these are, this was pretty new, this was very new, 2019, I think it finished up. Uh, this is older, as you can see, you got the, the peaked roof, et cetera, um, but also fairly high density, like in uh, Weymouth. So now to focus on mixed use development, I think we're pretty familiar with that concept. It blends a number of land uses, often takes the form of multi-story development with pub more public uses on the first floor. That could be ground floor retail. It could be offices, private uses above, usually residential. And um, like townhomes, like cottage cluster, it works on a variety of scales. So a couple of examples of this, this is in Manchester, by the sea. This is a really cool project. So I do want to take some time just to go over uh, the specifics of it. And so I am going to actually look for my proper page of notes here. Give me a second. While Karina is looking at for her notes, one of the things that I want to point out is that um, many of these mixed use developments that we're going to highlight are also near transit. Um, Amy Dane uses the phrase mobility-oriented development as opposed to transit-oriented development. And I think that gets to the fact that um, if you don't have transit, you may have other things like bike paths or uh, rail trails um, that help people's mobility. And that's um, you know maybe in your community, uh, the kind of um, connections um, that you might have. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and so you can you can see here uh, at the bottom of the photo, it is right near um, the commuter line in Manchester by the sea. Uh, this sort of building in the center, I don't have a pointer, but with the red roof is the station. Um, so this project uh, was initiated by the house, local housing authority. They bought a 2.2 acre site in 2000 from a private seller and created a nonprofit subsidiary to be the sponsor. And then they proceeded with a friendly 40B and the town voted to authorize bond funds to um, support the development of it. Um, there was a lot of financing and they wound up doing a 22 unit apartment building with 17 affordable units, 18 condos with five affordable, and then three retail condo units. Um, so very significant affordability, both rental and home ownership in this project. And that's just an example of uh, one of the one of the buildings um, with commercial on the ground floor and residential above. And another kind of poster child for mixed use development is uh, in Reading, Massachusetts, their uh, smart growth overlay district through 40R. They adopted it first in 2009 um, for one uh, uh, for, for a very small area and they got this um, development. I think it's the blue one kind of behind the tree in this photo here. 
And people liked it so much, they expanded it in 2017. It passed, the expansion passed pretty easily, even with the supermajority requirement. Um, they expanded it to, to cover pretty much most of the um, town center. And as you can see, it's right on the commuter rail here. Uh, and they, they focused in terms of messaging on mixed use development. The first development that went in had thousands of square feet of commercial, which is actually you know, not that common. Um, because it takes a lot of roofs to support that amount of uh, commercial space. Um, and so since they passed the expansion in 2017, they've seen considerable development. Um, it's brought a lot of foot traffic to support local businesses and has generally fostered um, increased vibrancy in their town center. Uh, their local businesses have said they love uh, the they love the fact that people just strolling in, particularly during COVID when people weren't commuting to work and just kind of passing by the businesses on the way to the station. They actually took advantage of coming in, getting coffee in the morning or lunch. Uh, and it was a real boon to support those businesses during an otherwise tough time. This is a different uh, scale of development. This is in Boston. Um, it's uh, 2019, it's workforce housing in, in Dorchester. Um, the way they kept the prices down were just by through density and economies of scale. This is a 64 units, but they're all pretty small. So not, not an example of family housing. Um, and they used alternative construction options, including some prefab uh, construction techniques. And the, the um, idea is that this could be replicable elsewhere um, and therefore the cost savings could be re replicable elsewhere. Um, one final example, this one's in Beverly. I'm fond of this, it looks so modest. Um, and it fits right in on their main street. And then you can see they got the parking in the back and offers quite a few uh, number of homes for people. All right, and then segueing from mixed use to multifamily development. Um, multifamily uh, is uh, multiple separate housing units within a single building or building complex. It can be side-by-side -side configurations or vertical configurations. As we showed with the uh, housing type slide earlier in the presentation, covers a very broad range of housing types. Uh, the census defines it as five or more units, um, but it can, some communities do two plus. Our zoning atlas defines it as two plus, can go all the way up to 20, 50, 100, you know, many hundreds units, tenure, um, either way, rental or home ownership. Uh, so this is an example I, I snuck in just because it's right around the corner from where I live and it's, it's a fabulous example um, of modest scale development. Uh, multifamily that fits into a neighborhood context. There's a lot of housing variety and diversity in the neighborhood of JP, uh, which certainly helps. This is an all affordable project, eight home ownership units, all sold to first time home buyers. Uh, it's by uh, JPNDC. Um, six of them are at a maximum household income of 80% and two of them at a maximum household income of 100%. And they were able to do it in part because they got mass dot land sold to them. Um, and then they also purchased a city owned parcel um, and completed a land swap with an embutter. So it's actually um, a decent size project, TOD right on the orange line. You can see, you know, some of the land was uh, totally vacant. Some of it is um, really historic press because those are historic homes that they kind of redeveloped maintaining the character. That's what it looks like uh, towards the end of the development. It's done now. I haven't, I haven't managed to shoot a more updated photo, but it's, it's really beautiful. This one's in Chelsea um, in what's known as their box dis district where they zoned for considerable multifamily housing. Um, it's on a larger scale. This is 41 units or 14.6 units an acre, one to four bedrooms. So uh, oftentimes with new development, we see ones and twos Maybe if we're lucky, some threes. This one goes up to fours, which is really wonderful, providing um, opportunities for families. Um, and then this is an example from Cambridge. I like it because it does combine um, historic preservation, both two homes in the back and this beautiful Victorian in the front. Uh, and I think it's just a good example of um, juxtaposition of different architectural styles and how the new can fit in with the old. It's also a great project because it's TOD, it's 100% affordable. They have 40 rental units, um, a mix of two and three bedrooms. So I think that's our final, yes, that is our final slide. 
So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because it looks like there's a ton of activity in the chat, which I haven't been able to uh, view. And we'll open it up to discussion. So I'm also putting the zoning atlas in the chat in case people are interested. Um, so Katie, should we pull some questions from the chat or are people able to unmute themselves? Um, that would be great. And Laura and Christine are going to be moderating okay. pulling questions and bringing them to you. Great. That will streamline things for sure. Thank you, Karina and Chris, for that great presentation. We've had a lot of project specific questions, but I'm going to start with some overall uh, Chapter 48 questions that uh, has been asked frequently, specifically, where can we find a list of MBTA communities? I know it lives in several places. It's, it's uh, um, enabled by the legislature, but is there an official list that folks can just look at on a website? Um, I was just uh, going to uh, start typing in the link to the guidance that I referenced. Um, there has been guidance issued for voting thresholds. And as I mentioned, there's going to be guidance for the MBTA communities. Uh, we have not posted a list. Um, the list does come from statute. It's chapter 161A, section 1. Um, so uh, you can find that list there. Um, but as soon as, as we're posting the guidance, I believe we're gonna post a list and, and maps so that you'll easily be able to um, determine if your community is an MBTA community. We also are gonna be reaching out and uh, um, sending communications to each one of the MBTA communities to make sure that they're aware of draft guidance when it's published. And a lot of the MBTA communities, if not most, are in the MAPC region. So if you have particular questions, feel free to reach out. Great, thank you. And the, another question that's been asked a lot is, how do you determine the 0.5 miles from a transit station? And I think this question specifically uh, would be better answered for commu MBTA communities that do not have a transit station. Yeah, and I think right now I'm going to have to just say, you please do wait for the guidance. Um, as I said, that um, there's a lot of issues to be worked out in um, figuring out this new section 3A and how we measure half a mile is definitely one of the questions that we're, uh, we're working over. Um, so please be patient and um, it will be uh, articulated in the guidance. Thank you. And I'm going to start with some project specific questions. I'm just scrolling through them. There was a question about cottage development. Um, so from Becky, how does the cottage development of 100% affordability avoid the stigma of that's the affordable housing? Um, in the Westford example, that 100%, um, it, it, um, I, I, my impression was that it did not have that stigma. Um, and you know, uh, at that time, Westford also had several other 40B projects that opened up. So um, they just, you know, it was just different kinds of housing that were available. What, what seemed more important to people, as you saw in the pictures, there were no attached, there were no garages at all. So, you know, was it the right housing for people? Was, and, and you know, the, the, the smallness of the size, um, it uh, would not fit well for a large family, for example, but it was very good for empty nesters um, or a single parent um, with uh, one or two children. So that was more what we heard about, not about um, the affordability, honestly, at all. I also think, you know, talking with your neighbors and planning staff and other uh, representatives of the community, talking with the public about uh, any concerns around affordability is always a good idea when zoning for new development or permitting new, new development of, of scale. Um, you know, if people feel like affordability is stigmatized, why? We always talk a lot with our community about who is this housing for if it's deed restricted at 100% of AMI or 80% AMI. Often, I mean, I will just say, first of all, depending on your perspective, for better or worse, that's pretty high. It's still fairly expensive. Um, these are for, you know, firefighters, teachers, uh, people who work at hospitals, um, people who work in restaurants, people who work in your community. 
so I think having those discussions about, you know, what are people con people's concerns, what are their biases, um, and, and what are some, you know, facts about affordable housing uh, is, is a good approach if you're worried about that. Uh, and M MEPC has facilitated a lot of those uh, engagement processes, public discourse processes, and, and um, produced some communication materials to help with that as well. I'm always happy to talk with communities uh, who are encountering, you know, concerns around new housing, whether it's affordable or not. And, and Karina makes a really good point. Um, one of the things that um, is, uh, there's a fantastic tool um, that I'll just do a little advertisement for. It's the Mass Housing Partnerships Data Town. Um, Data Town is an amazing resource that shows you at a glance what is the housing like in your community and how you compare to other communities. Um, if you do a housing production plan, which Westford did at this time. And so we were having conversations about an affordability gap in our community which also, again, put facts on the table and help people understand that the housing was not affordable for people like people's children, or again, as Karina mentioned, all of those uh, other workers, workforce housing. Thank you, Chris, for that plug. And just to reiterate what Karina said, MHP also supports cities and towns and any communities that reach out to us to help that start that dialogue around affordable housing. So feel free to reach out to any one of us on the community assistance team as well. Uh, there's a specific question about the project in Manchester by the Sea on Summer Street. And this could probably apply to some of the other projects that you brought up. Was there rezoning that required to happen before that project was built? Yeah, so my understanding with that project, I wasn't involved in the process, it was before my time, but it's a, it's a friendly 40B, so they okay. precisely didn't need to go through any kind of rezoning effort, um, certainly made it a smoother process, uh, particularly because the developer was, uh, you know, working with the town. It was really a town-initiated and oriented development because of the role that the housing authority had in it, so there, there wasn't much, um, you know, of a hostile, you know, kind of... Um, combative dynamic there at all. Uh, everybody was kind of on the same page. Um, and it, I, I believe it went pretty smoothly in terms of acquiring the land, putting the financing together, which was, which was pretty considerable. Um, the town vote was overwhelmingly positive for the bond financing. Uh, so I, th I think that was pretty smooth. That's my understanding anyway. And it's a, it's a fantastic project if you're ever over, over there. Uh, it fits in beautifully um, and is in a really just great transit-oriented location, walkable to local businesses and so forth. And uh, the Westford example of the cottages, um, that was also a friendly 40B. The town had owned the property and they um, uh, managed that process. And um, the cottages in West Newberry, um, uh, River's Edge, I think is the name of the development, that was an, an OSRD, that was a subdivision. You know, they had the um, zoning on their books, and so it did not require a rezone. It probably required a special permit, but it did not require a rezone because they had the bylaw in place that allowed for density bonuses based on size restriction. You know, we have time for maybe one or two more. I think there were several questions about um, this idea of moderately priced housing. Either Chris or Karina, can you talk about how that, how communities can think about that in a context sensitive way on us, especially for communities that have a very high median income? Chris, do you want to start? You want me to start? Sure, I will start. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, the uh, slide that Karina had that showed that incredible diversity of housing types. Um, you know, so that missing middle, the missing, you know, that the mid rise, the townhouses, cottages, um, that is one of the ways that um, are, uh, can really provide for that moderate housing in cost and also moderate in density. Karina? Yeah, I would say um, in addition to that, I mean, I think moderate really depends on your perspective. I think 80% uh, or of AMI is is really moderate uh, income housing. You know, you don't really get to um, really low income housing until you're at 60 or 50% of AMI. So that's certainly one perspective. Um, I think without deed restriction, it's certainly much harder to produce moderately priced housing, just the land costs and construction costs 
are so high. And I, if you're looking for that kind of housing in your community um, to kind of bridge this gap, because so much market rate housing nowadays is so expensive, just so high end. Um, one way to do that is through density and it can be incremental density. It doesn't have to be like a 50 unit project, but um, economies of scale for developers to access that, they do need to hit a certain number of units per acre and other, otherwise it's just too expensive. And so it's kind of finding that sweet spot through your zoning um, to take advantage of stick built uh, multifamily housing types before you're already into, you know, steel construction, which has its own costs associated with it. So I think creating those opportunities for the missing middle, you know, the townhomes, the courtyard apartments, like Chris mentioned, is, is one way to go for sure. And I would also say um, dimensional regulations in your zoning is another angle. You know, if you have huge minimum lot size uh, and, uh, you know, really like if your zoning is creating new, very large single family homes, those aren't going to be um, affordable to anyone with a moderate or middle income. Uh, and you're going to remember that, you know, whatever you see on the market without a deed rider, it's listed for whatever it's listed for. If you follow any of those transactions, it winds up going typically 20, 50, 100, $200,000 over asking in our region because there's such high demand. So certainly at a regional level, Creating more supply should bring costs down a little bit um, into that middle tier, but, it, it, but it's a huge amount of supply needed. So that's another reason to achieve density. And then at the site level, just hitting that benchmark of missing middle scale, you know, not twos and threes, but fours, fives, sixes, eight, tens, that will bring the price down and having smaller homes, smaller units as well, because it's price per square foot. And obviously, um, you know, we hope that the housing choice legislation will make it easier and more predictable that upzoning can happen um, at whatever scale that is that you're looking at, but that, you know, it will be easier and less unpredictable for people who are looking to build, um, whether you're, again, as a community development corporations often need a zone change or they often need a little bit more density. And so um, it's how we spend the affordable housing dollars that the state puts in um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, every year, we can't really use that, those funds to support and subsidize housing to make it moderately priced um, if we can't get the zoning changed. Thank you. And Karina, that's a really great reminder for our attendees to make sure to stay until our next session, which will start at 315. It's all about middle, missing middle housing. And I misread the clock. Um, that's what happens when you try to multitask on Zoom. Uh, we have unt until three o'clock to answer any questions. So please keep them coming and I'll hand it over to Laura to ask the next set of questions. Hi, Karina and Chris. Um, to go back to the MBTA um, community um, requirement for multifamily, um, there's a question about how is it not mandatory when it says shall? Well, because if you read the entire section, um, the, uh, the, the penalty or the, the lack of compliance means that you are not eligible for certain capital grant programs. So it is possible that a community could decide not to produce, not to do a multifamily district at 15 units an acre, but it would mean that they would not be eligible to apply for MassWorks or a Housing Choice Grant or the Local Projects Fund. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, will there be extra money on funding for communities that don't have water and sewer so they can do 15 units per acre? Um, I'll just leave it there, but I, I think there, you know, there are other options, but I'll ask that question. That was the question in there. Sure. Um, so uh, we're certainly aware that, um, you know, for the communities, and I, I think this is related to the MBTA communities uh, requirement yes. at, at 15 units an acre. Um, yes. We're aware that not only um, may there be a need for infrastructure dollars, but there also may be a need for technical assistance uh, to help communities have that conversation about multifamily, where it's going to go, uh, why they're doing it, what it looks like. Um, we do understand that that's not a, um, it's not just a you know, let's put a Warren article on the town meeting and, and, and it'll just get done. Uh, we understand that there's gonna need to be um, some assistance. So again, as we come out with a guidance over the next couple months, um, we'll also working on 
uh, technical assistance, um, you may know that uh, Currently in the MassWorks program, if you're uh, building housing, if you're a housing choice community, for example, you get some extra consideration. So we do already incorporate um, projects that are promoting new housing in our infrastructure programs um, because because we're coordinated and we do that. Uh, so, um, but I guess I, the, the main answer is please stay tuned um, for the dollars that might come um, for this uh, MBTA communities. Okay, and continuing on that, um, there's a new one. When DHCD guidance for MBTA communities is released later this summer, how long do you expect cities and towns will have to comply? And will enacting a 40-hour smart growth district adjacent to an MBTA station qualify under the reasonable size standard, uh, minimum 15 units per acre? I, I think it's a stay tuned, but I'm gonna let you answer that, Chris. <laughs> Thanks. I wish, uh, and, and we look to um, have webinars and other instructional things once we do have the guidance. And, and let me be clear, it is our plan to publish draft guidance and receive feedback. So you will actually see the, not just you know a PowerPoint, but you will see actual guidance and be able to comment on it. And we will take those comments under consideration. Um, so uh, that's the, the timing question. Um, but yes, stay tuned um, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the second part. Okay, let's see if we had any others. Um, let's see. Why did Housing Choice set restrictions on ADUs by right bylaws? Um, Sandwich had an ADU bylaw, but had to pass it at two thirds. Well, fleet is up in a couple of weeks. The fact that they set it at 900 square feet is making it necessary for a two thirds vote. Um, um, well, I, I can't comment specifically. I haven't seen those ADU bylaws. Yeah. Um, we did put a size limitation in the statute um, for accessory dwelling units. We felt it was important to ensure the legislature that um, uh, that eight accessory dwelling units were accessory and were not permitting duplexes. So there's actually a 900 square foot and a relative um, judge um, a relative proportion of a house size that are in the definition of accessory dwelling unit. And so we did that because we thought it was needed for the legislation to, to pass. Thanks. Um, do issues around accessibility figure into any of these options? Yeah, I mean, I think certain housing types lend themselves towards accessibility to accessibility more than others. I mean, certainly elevator buildings where you have, you know, a certain amount of density and steel construction uh, and multifamily development can be very accessible for a range of occupants. But um, I think for the smaller scale development, uh, the opportunity to produce single story homes, you know, we saw a lot of smaller ranch, home, ranch style or Cape style homes post World War II that, you know, dimensional regs and parcel sizes and other kinds of features of the zoning have, have as well as development land and construction costs really been zoned out of existence. So creating those single single floor homes, I think is another avenue. Um, and I, there are other tools to regulate accessibility. I mean, all development needs to hit certain standards um, beyond zoning. Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add. It's certainly not my area of expertise. Yeah, um, I mean, I would just say that um, uh, the AARP, um, so, uh, the Retired Persons um, Association, they are very much in favor of the accessory dwelling units as a way to help people age in place. And so aging in community is another part of the conversation about diverse housing types, because um, you know if you don't wanna take care of a yard or you wanna move into a single uh, uh, floor living, um, or you just want a smaller uh, unit, that's all part of the, that housing diversity. And so both whether you're a young family or a family that's moving into your senior years, um, those smaller housing types and the diverse housing types are both important. Um, and I think gets to some of the accessibility if you're talking about ADA accessibility. Great, thanks for that. Um, a question around, and, and I don't know the term, I don't know what the um, abbreviation is, so, so I'll just read it. It says for communities, that's CBD. I don't know what CBD stands for. Um, Commercial that, Business District, maybe, Laura? 
Maybe, and are also a historic district. Do you have good examples of how to add density while maintaining street facades and historic context? Um, I think that some of the photographs that we showed, um, one of them was from Lexington Center, um, and that was a brick building. It was three stories. It had dormer windows. Uh, it's on actually about three acres, so it's a bigger parcel than it appears from the from the two. It's actually on two different street sides. Um, but that was a redevelopment of uh, an old uh, motel in the middle of Lexington Center um, that provides 40 units. I think four of them were affordable um, that went through a, a, a planning process and a, a town meeting um, vote in, in Lexington Center. But it is a mixed use project um, of, um, of 15 units an acre. And I, I was direct messaged for some reason with a question. Um, in the, in the category under housing choice of expanding density, um, would modifying the zoning to allow for an additional story count for expanding density? So like bringing the height from two stories to three stories? Yep. Uh, yes, I think that, that's a good example of a dimensional standard that would allow for additional units is kind of the way that I phrase it typically, but that sounds like it would, it would um, uh, qualify for simple majority. Okay, I found another one. Will there be any effort to increase public transportation, buses or other local methods in MBTA communities that have no MBTA service within their borders? Um, I, 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 I can't speak, you know, totally. Uh, I don't want to speak for Mass DOT or the MBTA, um, but I do think that the Baker Polito administration is supportive of promoting transportation options, just like we're supporting uh, uh, housing options and housing diversity. Uh, there are a wide range of ways to provide uh, transportation alternatives. Uh, I mentioned bike paths and bike trails uh, as one in more rural areas. Um, some communities have funded their own uh, internal bus service. Um, some communities do that um, and share those internal bus services. Um, there are other types of uh, transportation, like transportation management associations that provide bus service um, around, uh, uh, linked to employers. Um, and then if you've, uh, again, I, I haven't been to Alewife since before the pandemic, but um, you know, if you're at any one of the major transit hubs, you're very familiar with the fact that other um, housing developments, Avalon, for example, might have a shuttle that runs from their um, their developments to uh, major transportation points. So um, again, without speaking for the state um, specifically, I'm just very aware that there are many, um, many creative ways to increase transportation options. And again, that could be a whole session of its own, just like we talked about housing diversity, there's really transportation diversity as well. Thanks, Chris. Um, this is kind of a Interesting question. What types of zoning changes might we run into that don't qualify for simple majority so we can work to avoid those? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, so I, 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 um, I, I gave a very brief overview of the changes to Chapter 40A, and uh, usually I do make a point to say that, you know, it is only certain zoning amendments that qualify for simple majority. So zoning amendments like changing from neighborhood business to, to industrial, that would not qualify for simple majority. So those are kind of the obvious ones. Uh, there is a provision in the law that does not allow you to mix different um, zoning types together, like to mix a zoning that does not qualify with zoning that does qualify. And so we're trying to work through those. Um, I would direct you, frankly, to the guidance. And I think um, one of the MHP it's folks, or uh, Karina put the link in the, in the chat, and thank you very much. Um, please do look carefully at the guidance. It is, um, I think it was last updated on May 20th. We will continue to update it, um, both with um, new questions that get asked and um, in refining our question, or re refining the answers to make sure that we're being really clear about how we interpret um, the, the law. So, um, I uh, might so, uh, yeah, Chris, yeah, I think the May 20th guidance, um, the updates was really helpful. I know a lot of the questions I've received from communities so far had to do with 
mixed use development, which kind of relates to what you're saying about how you bundle zoning amendments and changes or don't. I heard from one community that they sort of shot themselves in the foot because of um, something about parking in with an increase in density um, and they were sort of at odds and had to go with the two thirds route. But um, with mixed use development, I, I think that more clearly defined in the May 20th guidance, um, it's not just about a district that allows residential in addition to other kinds of uses. It's much more specific than that. So I would certainly check out that if you're considering um, zoning for mixed use development. Agreed. Um, the other thing I would like to just add um, that I didn't highlight, but if you go to the website, um, you will find um, we understand that the term eligible location, which is, you know, embedded in uh, in this and, and applies to multifamily and mixed use um, is kind of a new term and it's a term of art. And so we are offering advisory opinions uh, by the department to people who ask. And so there's a request form that you can find. It has to come from a community, from a board uh, or from a mayor, um, not just an individual and not a developer, but um, if, you're, if you can get a planning board or a select board or a city council or a mayor to make this request, um, we will uh, look at and um, communicate with you about what is an eligible location, because that's kind of one of the new pieces that's been added in this, in this new um, reform to Chapter 40A. And we're trying to help people, you know, understand what are the changes and how do they, how does it work? Great, I think Christine has one more question for you. So I'll hand it off to her. Thank you, Laura. And to just take this last question, um, Chris, if you could talk a little bit more about what the feedback process would be for the draft guidance, how much time and specifically when she would expect it. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm afraid I it's gonna be a little bit of a stay tuned. Again, we expect it to be published um, this summer. Um, we will be giving adequate time <laughs> for people to respond. Uh, we are trying to wrap it up so that we can have final guidance in place um, in, the, in the fall uh, so that communities, whether you're, you know, you might have something that's on your fall town meeting that would um, be able to allow you to comply or as you're preparing for spring town meeting. So we're trying our best to be um, both diligent and thorough in um, connecting with stakeholders and publishing the draft guidance to get feedback, um, but also wanting to move forward to issue the final guidance. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give a better answer than that, but that's, that's where we are right now. Well, I'm gonna jump in and just thank Karina and Chris for an amazingly informative session. The takeaway I got, and I'm just looking at the chat, is um, so much of this is gonna be case by case, and luckily there's gonna be a lot of us available to help with those discussions. And at your local level, your town council, us at MHP, DHCD, MAPC, we're all, re we're all ready to help. So um, you're not in this alone, we're all in this together. And uh, thanks again, Chris and Karina, amazing presentation. And we will see you back here at 315. Thank you everyone, so great to be here. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, bye-bye. We're back. Um, it is 3.15 on the dot, so we're doing terrific. Um, I'm really excited to announce this next uh, session today, Missing Middle Housing Strategies for Municipalities. And we're joined by two speakers, Jeremy Lake, uh, senior associate at Union Studio, um, and Nate Kelly, principal planner of the Horsley and Witten Group. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to you guys, and I'm sure we're going to learn a ton. Great. Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jeremy. You can see Nate here as well. Uh, we're going to both present this together. I'll go ahead and share my screen so you can kind of see what we want to talk about today. All right, Nate, can you see it? You good to go? I always feel like you gotta confirm that for some reason. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Katie. As Katie suggested today, we're here to talk about uh, missing middle housing uh, and strategies for that for varying municipalities. And if you don't know what missing middle housing is, don't worry, we're gonna introduce it and talk about it so you'll understand what we mean as we move forward. Uh, an overview for the session, I'll just go ahead and read this. Across the country, more and more towns find themselves grappling 
with the interrelated challenges of housing affordability, housing choice, and outdated zoning. Many are considering increased levels of density as a potential solution, but face pushback from communities concerned about the character of conventional multifamily development, especially in communities that are predominantly single family in scale. One possible solution is missing middle housing, a range of building types that slot somewhere between the scale of conventional single family detached homes and garden style multifamily developments. This session will share recent efforts at educating communities about the option of increased densities in forms that are sympathetic to their existing character, as well as some of the challenges, solutions, and approaches for incorporating them into their zoning regulations. So again, it's just a quick introduction to who we are. I'm Jeremy Lake. I'm a senior associate at Union Studio Architecture and Community Design. Uh, we are based in Providence, Rhode Island, but we do work around the country. Uh, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Nate Kelly, who's a principal with Horsley Witten Group. Uh, Horsley Witten has offices throughout New England, uh, and Nate and I actually work quite a bit together on things. He's, he's in their Providence office, and we collaborate on a number of these sorts of efforts. Nate, you want to say anything in general as an introduction? No, thank you. That's perfect, Jeremy. Let's get to it. Definitely. So this is an outline of what we want to talk about today. Um, I'm going to go first talking a little bit about Missing Middle and um, the education of Missing Middle to the public and hopefully to you all as well if you're not familiar with it. And I'm going to do that through a recent project we did with the Cape Cod Commission that was called Community Resiliency by Design. Uh, once I've gotten through that portion, I'm going to hand it off to Nate, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the regulation of Missing Middle, uh, including the context in Massachusetts. Uh, but also sharing a case study, a project, uh, a rezoning effort he and I are working on together in South Kingstown, Rhode Island. And we'll conclude with a few takeaways, some tips and pitfalls, some resources for additional information. And then with the time that we have left, which we hope to leave plenty, uh, we'll open it up for question and answer and discussion with you all. So community resiliency by design. So we had a project here for a few years with the Cape Cod Commission that really came out of their efforts uh, they rewrote the regional policy plan. Uh, this was published back in 2018, Framing the Future. They were looking at a number of issues across the Cape as they, as they tend to do. Uh, but housing became one of the forefront issues that they realized and wasn't anything new. They knew they had a challenge with housing. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the key things to understand on the Cape is that 86% of the region's land is already developed or protected. So in this graphic of the Cape, all of those sort of olive green areas or protected natural areas the varying blues are, are the pre-developed areas from just different periods of time. And in theory, those light green areas are sort of the undeveloped areas, but it's a little misleading because like that big one to the left is a National Guard base. Some of the bigger ones to the right are ponds, right? So they aren't necessarily even areas that you could develop. And what that suggests is that there's very little land left for future growth, that the high demand they face, but with limited supply for new product means that there is increased land costs. Um, and in general, the infrastructure they have is very stressed, and particularly when you talk about housing and things like septic and some of the interrelated challenges of, of, of those things, all of those things are combining to create a real, a real challenge out there, although it's not unique to the Cape. Um, some of the statistics that came out of that report, um, they, they identified housing affordability and housing choice as two of the more significant challenges. And so the percentages you see there you know, when we talk about housing choice, 62% of the national housing stock is in detached single family homes. So the majority are in detached single family homes. In Massachusetts, that number is only 52%, which is to say there's a, a larger mix of other types, smaller multifamily, single family attached, all sorts of things along those lines. Uh, but what's interesting is when we look at the Cape, in the Cape, it's 82% single family detached homes. And so they have a real mismatch out there, a real challenge out there with having predominantly one type of housing, but a variety of, of um, housing types or, 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 or family types that are looking for different housing solutions. But they've built kind of the same thing for so many years now that, that, that housing choice is a real issue. And then the bars across the bottom, which I know are kind of hard to make out, but you'll get the point, is the, the affordability challenge. So those are a series of towns on the Cape and the bars on the left are the comparison of an affordable home price in dark blue with what the medium home price was in the orange in 2015. And then the bars on the right are those same blue is the affordable home price, whereas orange is the median home price. And what you can see is that in 2015, there was already a bit of a gap which are projected out to 2025. Those gaps are becoming larger and larger and that trend is continuing to grow and grow. So the affordability issue 
is, is getting exponentially harder to solve. So as part of their policy plan, amongst many other issues in the housing goals and objectives that the two big ones we're here to talk about today are promoting an increase in housing diversity and choice and trying to increase housing affordability. But I would also point out that the other two issues of on the Cape year round housing supply is an issue. There's a, a lot of the new construction that's done actually gets purchased as second homes, again, which exacerbates the problems, um, but also an, an intention of improving existing housing stock. And one of the things we talk about later is you know, some of the existing homes that are out there could be converted to other types of housing that might be a possible uh, win-win on two of these fronts. So that was the Cape Cod Commission's um, policy plan, and they brought us in largely to help address that idea of promoting housing diversity and increased affordability. Um, and we're finding that in a lot of cases that the approach being considered is, is increased density. And so one of the things they asked us to do was to begin community conversations around techniques for meeting the increased demand of housing on the Cape, but to do so with the input of communities, really get out there and talk to the towns and talk to the planning staff in the various um, towns on the Cape, uh, to try to identify ways of doing this in a way that would enhance and support the existing character. So don't just come in and propose things that are out of scale or out of context or wouldn't be a good fit because that's not going to do anybody any good. Really, we need to start hosting these conversations. And ideally, as they were doing on the Cape, the idea was to have those conversations before the actual rezoning um, or projects were being proposed that were at these increased densities and so that hopefully you could start to relieve some of the fears or at least have some conversations around those issues before it was front and center. So as part of the Community Resiliency by Design project, we actually worked in five towns, uh, Sandwich, Falmouth, Hyannist, East Enum, and Orleans. Uh, and in each of those communities, we had a series of public workshops uh, and worked with the local staff on, on these issues. Um, and so in each of them, we had two public presentations, but in addition to those, uh, we were also able to present at the Capes Cod Commission's One Cape Summit, uh, as well as the Cape Housing Institute, which was a similar session to this, but for you know a, a number of organizations out on the Cape. And so what was great is over the course of two years, we had this conversation, talked about these issues with a number of different folks, which was really great because we were there, again, trying to get the word out, but also get feedback from the community about what they felt was appropriate solutions for these sorts of things. And so uh, it was really wonderful to be able to sort of continually go back out to the Cape and go into a new community and talk about these things and, and, and help refine the approach that we were proposing. So again, one of the things we started with in every community was, was trying to address why we're here talking about the need for additional density or, for, or building new housing. And so the graph on the left kind of reinforces what I was talking about a little bit earlier, but you can see that blue line uh, going from 2015 to 2025, and you're seeing a, a trend of house prices increasing by 5% a year. Uh, but the gray bar, which is two down from that, is showing how the income for those trying to buy those homes is only increasing by 2% a year. So again, the problem is, is, is exacerbated as time goes by. And on similar light, the orange line is showing how rents are increasing by 4% a year, but the renter incomes are only going up by 1% a year. So this is a real challenge. And again, it's nothing new. You can see here, we, we put a copy of one of the housing production plans. These things have been identified for a long time but no one's really been able to really tackle and try to address it in a meaningful way. We started by talking to the communities about that challenge. Of note, the other thing we did in each of the communities, that the, the conversation wasn't a broad conversation about how you could redevelop anywhere in their town. We really tried to focus in on zones or districts that the towns themselves were helping us identify where there were opportunities where additional density might be appropriate. So in the case of East Ham on the left, um, that's essentially their commercial corridor. That's where the sort of main road cuts through town and, you know, currently is a lot of smaller scale restaurants and things, but it's a place where if you were going to add density in Easton, that'd probably be the appropriate place to do it. Not the areas outside of that, which are predominantly single family, but really in that concentrated core. Similarly, in Orleans, the village center had already been identified as a place that already in, uh, allowed for higher density multifamily mixed use commercial. Um, in Falmouth, the Davis Straits area is, a, is an area that's sort of auto-centric retail just outside of their historic core. You can see the colored areas are the areas we were focused on, but you can also see just below that red area, you know, it's a, just a single family home community that backs right up on, you know, staples and really intensive commercial uses. So there weren't sort of good transitions in place there. In Hyannis, a zone on their east end that is predominantly built out, but there were a lot of opportunities for infill and there was real pressure to do so. This is adjacent to the hospital um, and the ferry out from, from Hyannis. 
Um, and, and in Sandwich, we actually, there was a district where they're going to be doing some sewer improvements. And so adding sewer was going to suddenly unlock the potential for increased density or, or, or housing that was in great need. And so identified some pockets in that zone where that might be appropriate. So again, when we're talking to the community about increased density, we're not just talking about it anywhere in the community, we're talking about it in very specific areas where it could make some sense. So one of the real important points, I think the key takeaway for today, what we were trying to talk about is that density can take many forms. We, we tend to think of it on purely a numerical basis, but when we say 20 units to the acre, what does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything. Really the important one does mean something, but to the community at large, it doesn't tend to mean anything. And what's important to understand is that it's the forms of that density that are the thing that really resonate. And so this was a, a comparison we made where on the right is a project that my firm did a number of years ago in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, Cottages on Green. It's a series of cottages around a cottage court. On the left is what the underlying zoning called for. So it allowed for up to 20 units to the acre, but it expected it as a sort of multifamily building, sort of with the biggest buffers you could put around it, which isn't to say it disappears. Um, but you, know, you, you get the density, but it's not really a form that the community was a big fan of or supportive of. So on the right, what we proposed was the same density. So this is the same 20 units to an acre, but the units, instead of being consolidated or distributed, and the open space, instead of being distributed, is consolidated. And the forms are things that fit in very nicely with the single family context that's around there. And in fact, the community was in, in huge support of this project. Obviously, it broke almost every law, <laughs> every bylaw in their zoning code. So it required a lot of conversations around waivers and why we were trying to do what we were trying to do. But again, that speaks to how sort of our zoning in many places is outdated or is picturing models that aren't the appropriate models uh, for the specific context. So again, when we went through each of these communities and had these conversations, um, one of the things we'd like to start off with is we would, we would show a pair of these at a time. So not this whole slide at once, but we'd show these two pictures here in the upper left without the supporting text. And we'd just put up two pictures with, with, with no other context and say, you know, which one of these is the higher density? We would really sort of quiz the group and see what they thought. So people would show hands, some would go one way, some would go the other. And then we try to point out what the actual statistics or numbers behind those forms were. So in the case of these two on the top left, you know, this image on the right is just a sort of typical single family home that you could find anywhere on the Cape. Um, even these are on smaller lots, half acre to quarter acre lots, which is to say two to four units to the acre. On the left was a building that we found in Falmouth that is a five unit building that just is in the form of a very, of a large single family home, but on a half acre that's suddenly 10 units to the acre. So we have two buildings that are very similar in form, um, but one has five units, one has one unit. As a result, one has five times the density of the other. Um, but at the end of the day, those two could be neighbors and no one would bat an eyelash at it. On the lower left, we again showed two images, said, what do you think? And in this case, we were trying to show these are both buildings that are, you know, four or five unit buildings that happen to look more like a single family home. The one on the left just happens to be on twice the, the lot that the one on the right does from the street has similar frontage. You know, walking down the street, it would have a similar scale and character, but the one on the right actually has double the density and so on and so forth. We'd show townhouses versus manor houses. We showed how even two buildings that are a similar scale on a similar size lot the one on the left, the units themselves are much smaller. So you get more units in the same mass. So it has a higher density. So again, density at the end of the day is a numerical question. But the, what we were trying to make a point of is that really what you want to understand is what the form of that density is to understand whether or not it might be appropriate or not for, for any given context. So this is when we introduced the concept of missing middle. So, so missing middle is a, is a phrase that was coined by a firm out on the West Coast called the Opticos. And really what they were referring to is that there are these this whole range of housing types that slot somewhere between a single family detached home and what we might typically think of as a multifamily project. And these are things like accessory dwelling units, little cottage courts, duplexes, townhomes. Um, the rest are sort of varying forms of multifamily. So stack flats is really you know, the, the classic triple decker that you might have heard of in Boston or some urban areas around Massachusetts where you have three smaller units that are stacked on top of each other, but in a form that just looks like a single family home. Uh, a manor house is really a building that has four to six units in it, but in the scale of a single family home. And a walk up at the upper end, this is a building that's probably somewhere in the range of six to 12 units, just with a single walk up stairs. So starting to be a little bit bigger than a, the massing of a single family home, um, but certainly not yet at the scale of a, what most people picture when you say multifamily. And so there are places where that might be appropriate. Um, 
And so in each of these communities, we would introduce those types or at least whichever ones of those types we thought might be appropriate there. But more importantly, what we did is we tried to find good local examples of those so that what we were proposing wasn't something that was something we found in California. It was literally something we found on the Cape, ideally even in their own neighborhood. And so as you'd imagine, cottages were something that were relatively simple to find on the Cape, but we would go around and find various examples of it. Um, sometimes there would be you know, individual cottages and individual lots. Ideally, we would find examples of cottage ports. We would calculate what those existing examples had in terms of density to give us a sense of what might be an acceptable range in that community. Um, and then we would often conclude by putting up again a couple of visual preference images and talk through with the folks that were in the room. Is there something about the cottages on the left or the cottages on the right that you think is more appropriate here? Again, a way is gauging their input about things like the style of the architecture, the scale of the architecture, the, the, the sense of the place that they're creating. Um, as a means of, again, educating them, but also getting some feedback at the same time about these issues. And then after we'd gone through those types, we would circle back to saying, now that we've talked about these various house types, when we're talking about the specific areas we've identified in your community, which or, or would any or all of these be appropriate? Again, it was one last chance to talk through those things. We would get really great feedback. You know, if you're going to do something as big as these walk-ups, I'd hate to do it in you know, this pocket or this neighborhood, but doing it up where we already have a lot of commercial activity could make a lot of sense. So that would help guide us in terms of what we were then going to come back with and talk about in our second session with the community. In order to try to engage a larger group than just the folks that turn out at the public meetings, we also did a visual preference survey online. And so because you don't have the ability to sort of talk these issues through with folks, you have to be really sort of clever about what sort of issues you ask them to address. And so one thing we thought that we could really get really good input on was thinking about style and thinking about scale where we wouldn't have to give a whole lot of background. And so what we did was we would have a series of, of um, slides in the, in the survey. You would only see one of these images at a time. And the collection on the left, we were asking, do you think a building of this style would be a good fit within the study area? And you could answer definitely a good fit, maybe a good fit, maybe not a good fit, definitely not a good fit. So we gave them a bit of a sliding scale of where they thought that would, would, would fit. And we had a slide, we had a scale of images from more traditional architecture to more contemporary. And we had images that ranged from single family homes to townhouses to multifamily, just to see sort of what we could gauge from that. And then we did the same exercise with scale. So for single family homes, we did from a single story up to two and a half, townhouses one and a half up to three, multifamily from two up to three and a half. And again, we'd only show them one of these at a time. They were sort of scrambled in terms of the order, but we would just sort of gauge a reaction looking at that image and seeing what we would, we would, we would find out. And what was really useful is we used that exact same survey and that same set of images in all five of those communities, even though that happened over a stretch of time. So not only did it help us get a sense of what was meaningful for that community, but it also let us kind of cross compare, which was kind of interesting as well. So for instance, they, when we showed the single family, um, single story cottage and asked, is the scale appropriate for the study area? What was interesting is in Falmouth, the overwhelmingly folks said actually not. There was a general sense that that might be um, not taking enough advantage of an opportunity. We're really trying to build housing and density here and doing single story cottages in that zone is not appropriate. Whereas in some of the other communities like East Ham or Hyannis, people were, were very much in support of something at that scale, even though that might not be the highest form of density that we could provide. It certainly is appropriate for the context as far as the members that, you know, the folks in the community that were responding would say. And so again, as we would slide up the scale and comparing different communities, one and a half stories tend to be a good Good fit in most places, two stories, generally acceptable, starting to slide off a little bit. What was interesting is when you get up to about two and a half stories, we saw sort of the inverse response that we did to the single story or Falmouth Orleans, again, generally suggesting that's probably, you know, a, could be a good suggested fit here, but in some of the other communities, you're starting to get a little bit too big and too, too broad here. So again, when we were coming back and proposing solutions, it wasn't a one size fit all. We were really trying to utilize this input as a means of catering the solutions to those. So again, same thing here with the style and again, a, a, a range of, of responses, although closer in terms of what would be considered appropriate um, for the various towns uh, as we went through those. And we you know, consolidated those results and, and, and talked about those things as well. So in the second session, when we came back to the communities, this is where we actually proposed actual building types and models that could be utilized. Um, and so again, we would circle back to each type 
Now we've put a little bit more fine tooth thought into it. You know, we'd actually propose models that again, if we heard you could go up to as much as two and a half stories, we're showing two and a half stories. We heard generally support for things that are a little more traditional in terms of their style. So we showed something a little more traditional in terms of the style. We, we confirmed or adjusted things like, you know, these would be two to three stories. The acceptable range is 10 to 15 units to the acre. Um, we would give some diagrams about how those operate, which was helpful for some of those smaller multifamily types. You know, for a duplex, that's pretty straightforward. But when we talk about a stack duplex, what does that mean? But we also did want to show that even though we're proposing this sort of prototypical model, that we're not suggesting that's the only way it could and should be done. So, you know, it might be two stories or three stories. They might be attached, might be more contemporary where that's appropriate. So again, suggesting that there could still be a variety of ways these are actually deployed at the end of the day. And we finished in each case with an illustrative case study. So, so again, showing how, you know, here's a little sort of monopoly house version of what we're talking about here, but here's how that actually plays out on a particular site. Um, and so the first three sites that we worked on together were, were the first three towns were found with Easton and Orleans. And in all three of those within the study areas we had identified, we actually would, we found a particular parcel of land and we proposed utilizing those missing middle types as proposed and just tried to show what you could come up with and what would be possible. So in Falmouth, this, this was part of the strip retail center I pointed out that had single family homes right behind it. We said, what if we tore down the staples, took out the Starbucks, and instead proposed some of these larger walk-up buildings out along the main road and on the parking with some mixed use underneath of them. But as we transition back to the single family neighbors, let's step it down to maybe some of the smaller multifamily types and even all the way down to duplexes when we're actually right up adjacent to the single family homes. So it's not a one type solution. It was a mixture of these types that provided a blended density of 20 units to the acre. But by stepping down, the point was to make sort of a transition so that as you move and are getting closer to those, those edges that you have an appropriate scale for that immediate adjacency. Similar exercises in East and Orleans, ranging from anywhere from 10 to 20 units to the acre. So, so that's that range that's that we've been calling it sort of a moderate density. So, you know, the single family densities tend to be, you know, eight units to the acre or less. A lot of times the books for multifamily are 20 units to the acre plus, but there was this missing middle, these things that are somewhere between the two that might be the reasonable compromise for adding some housing choice and building some new housing, uh, but in, in a form that's again, sympathetic with the existing context. In Hyannis, the issue was more about infill than it was sort of imagining you were going to sort of redevelop three, four, five acres at a time. Um, so we identified a couple of other strategies, things like retrofitting existing structures. This is actually a project um, that we Union Studio have in, in Hyannis, converting a mixed use building that was retail with office upstairs to actually having units upstairs, including the addition of another half story. There's more of a demand for housing than there is for office. So you can do a conversion, but preserve the existing character of what's in place. Um, we also found in this part of the town that there were a lot of underutilized lots. You can see there's a lot of sort of parking lots that wouldn't have been there historically, but over time there was either pressure to redevelop or certain buildings fall into disrepair. The building was raised, but the lot was left empty. So there are opportunities for either consolidating parking that already exists and creating new building lots or redeveloping lots that have just been left fallow. Um, but another strategy particularly that we, we promoted here in Hyannis was, was allowing for the addition of accessory dwelling units. So on lots that currently have a single unit, allow them to add a second or maybe even third unit. And there were a lot of examples already of smaller accessory structures on the site, be they garages or sheds or even cottages in some cases. But why not allow folks to convert those to accessory dwelling units or add accessory dwelling units? And you can see it would fit right into the existing sort of context and fabric that, that it, it's, it already exists there. And then last but not least in South Sandwich, this is where the new sewer was being added. And so we wanted to show something at a much larger scale. This is actually a town owned parcel of land. It has a few ball fields on it, but it's other, otherwise largely empty. Um, and in this particular case, it backs up to some preserved areas, but that could just as readily have been single family development. What we said is again, let's imagine using a range of the various types we've been talking about but, what's, but let's limit it to the sort of lower end scale on the, on the periphery as if you were transitioning down to something like a natural preserve or even single family neighbor. So we're gonna limit ourselves to the types that were maybe five to 10 units to the acre. But as we make our way towards the core, towards the fields, even out towards the main road in the grocery store, we'll allow some mixed use or utilize some of our denser types again within this, within this range. So that we're, you know, as we work our way away from the edges and towards the core, we're allowing for higher and higher densities. And the point was that at the end of the day on this, you know, 40 acre buildable site, 
at that blended 10 units of an, to an acre, we're talking about 440 new units that could be built here. Whereas if we use that same parcel of land and redeveloped it under the existing zoning that only allowed for one and a half units to the acre, you're only getting 63 units on that same land. So the point here was trying to show how it really adds up. Just this one parcel alone, we could be providing 300 additional units in a place that really needs them in types that are what they're missing and could be really utilized. And imagine spreading those land costs around. That's how you start to address some of the affordability issues. Now that same land is being distribute amongst 440 units instead of 60 units. So that would be a means of trying to bring those down, those costs. But again, doing so in a way that makes sense, utilizing types that we found in the existing communities, um, but understanding that that's gonna uh, you know, require some rezoning or certainly some special permits and various conditions to allow for that to happen. So the last thing I'll state is that, you know, with the, with the emphasis really being on form less so than the numbers, the last thing we did working together with the Cape Cod Commission was wrote this, what we call a framework for form-based code. So it was really sort of an introductory booklet for a lot of the sort of town planners and the jurisdictions and even the residents to be able to flip through and say, here's what's meant by a form-based code, because that might be one really good option for when you reconsider rezoning, um, you know, a, a great solution, a potential solution for that. So this is available online. You could ignore the link at the bottom. If you just search Cape Cod Commission form-based code, this is the first thing that pops up. And it's a great resource that we worked on together with them. So. With that, I will pass it over to Nate. Thanks, Jeremy. How's my mic? Thumbs up? Good. All right. Um, so to all of you uh, who I may be meeting for the first time, my name is Nate Kelly, and I've been working on zoning reform uh, through Horsley Witten for you know, maybe the last 15 years or so on a more intense basis. Um, and I've done work in, in primarily in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, but also in Connecticut and New Hampshire and a little bit beyond. Um, and these, these issues are very, are remarkably transferable, um, even though we're working in, with different statutes. And of course, the devil's in the details with a lot of this language. Um, the issues that frame these conversations and the issues that frame ultimate code reform um, would... Um, you know, are, are, are very transferable. So I'm going to start with a very brief reminder uh, for those of you who saw the last presentation of the framework um, that, that, that puts us all in, in where we are in Massachusetts. Um, but then I'm going to go south of the border or west, depending on where you are, um, into my home state of Rhode Island and talk about um, how some of these discussions are playing out in South Kingstown um, which is, which again is very transferable, the, the market there, the environments, the landscape, uh, very similar to a lot of Massachusetts communities. Um, and some of the tools that we use in Rhode Island are also similar to, to Massachusetts. Uh, but if you could take me to the next slide, Jeremy. So just to, for those of you who got to hear Chris and Karina in the previous discussion, um, they really went into this in, in greater detail. And a number of times when Jeremy and I are working on these projects, you know, Jeremy will, will often come back to the same point. Can we stop talking about density? If this is gonna be so hard. Can we, can we spend more of our time talking on form? Um, and obviously there's a lot of advantage to that with what you've just seen in the way, you know, Jeremy and his team can visualize things. And, I, you know, I always say, I wish we could. I wish we could just exclusively talk about form, um, but if we are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and communities are gonna to use tools like chapter 40R, for example, um, to get at this missing middle issue, which is a good fit. Um, unfortunately, or you know, for better or for worse, the, the statute um, has us answer to density as a numeric threshold. So we really can't get away from it. It's sort of baked into the conversation from the get-go because um, we do have to meet these different thresholds that you heard a bit more about in the last uh, presentation. Next slide, please, Jeremy. And even with, even with the Housing Choice Initiative, which there, you know, a lot of questions remain around how these changes to 40A are gonna play out. And that was, again, uh, talked more about in the previous presentation. There are numeric density thresholds baked into this um, so we really can't get away from those from those numbers. So 
you know, with that, I do, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Next slide, please, Jeremy, and go down to um, talking about the town of South Kingstown. Next slide. And this community, for those of you who have not visited uh, this area, beautiful community um, with a lot of varied landscape. So there are beautiful sort of urban village, you know, very human scale village areas, extremely rural areas, coastal areas, suburban bedroom communities. There's a mix of areas that have infrastructure that don't have infrastructure. There's viable agriculture, there's industry, there's mass transit. Um, it's, it's a remarkably diverse community in that sense of the landscapes and the different opportunities and the infrastructure that you have historic vistas, uh, coastal cottage communities, enormous uh, mobile home communities. Um, so it really has it all. Next slide, please. And they fancy themselves a collection of villages and that's an important part of their, um, their, their sort of their ethos. If you read their uh, community master plan, it really is organized all around this idea of different villages and different village character. So when we started this project, you know, I think Jeremy did a great job of showing you, um, you know, the importance of a lot of the visual tools um, that we use. Um, but we spent a significant amount of time up front um, in sort of closed meetings with stakeholders as well, but just thinking and talking about messaging, how we were going to set the stage for this. And in the previous discussion, uh, the previous presentation. You know, I really like the fact that, you know, Karina started talking about very basic questions of, you know, why is affordable housing important? How does it benefit our community? Getting into the identity, the economics, the diversity, and the needs that they have already in the community, not even looking at projections. So we had a strong, well-documented need for housing diversity, and that was really at the, the heart of this discussion. And when we set up a, a website for this project, we spent a considerable amount of time, you know, making sure that this message was uh, bite-sized, it, it was accessible, easily consumed, it was very clear, and it sent a really sort of strong case um, at the very beginning. Why are we even doing this? Why are we having this conversation? Why is this important? Um, and that was a really an important foundation to this. Next slide, please, Jeremy. Another thing that we did sort of to, to get things going, there's a couple of slides here on homework. Um, homework is critical to this. Um, I've done a lot of this work and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say that we've succeeded all the time. And where, where we have not succeeded, I think is when we haven't had enough time or resources or maybe just didn't plan enough um, to get our homework done. And this was a really important piece for South Kingstown. The, the relationship between the development community and the planning board and the planners um, is not one that is characterized by trust. Um, it, and there's been, there's a history of this. These developers are local. And, you know, when they say they can't do something, you know, the planning board just doesn't believe them. Um, so there's been a sort of years and years of, you know, why won't you build this? And the developer's saying it doesn't pencil out, it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, again, really nothing to, to look at. So we had a real estate economics firm uh, come in early and just do some, you know, very basic pro forma work for us. And basically what we wanted to answer is, let's just, you know, simply look at the median income in this area. What are our target price points? You know, based on the 30% the rule, what are we looking at for rent and what are we looking at for purchase? So for purchase, it was 275,000. For rent, it was 1,100. And now, does it work? So we ran some numbers and, you know, these, these tables can get a little complicated, but really what comes out the other end was the realization that, you know, lo and behold, the developers were right about the single family homes. No matter how much we shrink the lots in South Kingstown, we're not gonna get even to that 275,000. It just doesn't happen that way. They were right about the apartments. We can't get 
to eleven hundred dollars, uh, you know, just sort of market rate, um, irrespective of the density, you know, that you're going to give us. So those two pieces don't work. But then when we looked at the townhomes and some of that missing middle stock, actually we think we can get there. So this was a great educational moment. And you know, the developers could argue some of our assumptions and that's fine, um, but, it, but it happened sort of in an informed way. And so it was a chance for the planning board and develop, the development community to have this conversation with sort of some third party material that says, okay, if we are going to be looking at single family homes um, as part of this housing strategy, then there's gonna to have to be a subsidy involved. If rental is gonna be part of the answer um, to how we deal with housing diversity, there's gonna to have to be some kind of subsidy involved because these numbers don't pencil out. So this was a great exercise for us to do up front as part of our homework. Next slide, please, Jeremy. And then Jeremy talked about this um, uh, with the CAPE work, and this was also invaluable to us. Um, Jeremy and his team and, and some folks from our shop just spent a lot of time walking around, um, driving around and taking pictures, um, just making sure that people are aware of the existing diversity of stock that they have. Um, because we all know, those of you who have had, you know, housing discussions in the more suburban and rural communities, um, you know, folks will just say, well, this is completely out of character. Well, actually, it's not completely out of character because, you know, here's an example of some of the um, units that you have in your community today. We can have a conversation about whether or not you think it's appropriate or whether you like it or what you like and don't like, but it's here. It's part of who you are. It's part of your identity as a community. And so that is, you know, again, an important thing for us to sort of get an inventory of, show people what they have bring that homework to the discussion um, so we don't have, you know, people making statements that we don't have any evidence, evidence to refute. Next slide, please, Jeremy. And once we get that inventory, you saw some of the slides that Jeremy produced earlier, we start to dig in a little bit and we, sh and we start to educate the community about, okay, you see these from the street, you see these as you drive around, Here's a little bit more information about what this is, about what is a townhome, what is a stacked flat, what are these different typologies, what do these words mean, um, how does it play out, and this really starts to prime the pump for later on when we're getting into zoning standards and those things, we're building people's capacity to think about housing on a slightly more technical level, slightly more, um, you know, design-based. Um, if you will. So next slide, please. So that was the homework sort of on the inventory and the homework a little bit on the numbers, on the finance piece of things. And we also wanted to do our homework on perceptions. Um, and so we wanted to get a feel for what we're getting into, really test our assumptions. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rhode Island, uh, we have mandatory comprehensive planning. Um, so every community is required to do this, and in a, in a situation like that, which is great to, ha to have those plans as, as a reference, um, you can actually get a little lazy about your assumptions going forward so you're, because you sort of carry from one plan to the next. So we wanted to test some of those assumptions, test those previous plans, and also look a little bit at how people perceive the community and test their knowledge. So just a couple of, a few examples here in these slides of the questions we asked. Go ahead, Jeremy. We looked at the village of Peacedale, which was sort of their second most densely populated um, village, pretty small, very small scale, um, you know, doesn't cover more than, oh, geez, I can't imagine how many square miles, but maybe, you know, 40, 50 acres or something like that, um, 100 acres. Uh, but anyway, go ahead, Jeremy, to the next one. We wanted to ask them a little bit how they perceive this and their other villages. Um, and we tested this, this idea that's been in the comprehensive plan for decades. Um, should new housing be focused on the primary villages? Should we be looking at these more densely uh, developed areas, the same way uh, Jeremy looks at villages on Cape Cod? And 60% said yes, and so that was, a you know, that sort of reaffirmed what we thought. And what was interesting was of the, of the people who said no, 
Um, it wasn't that they were saying no to this as a housing initiative. A lot of them were saying, we need housing diversity all over town. So they were sort of flipping the question on us a little bit in terms of the comments that they provided, uh, which was an interesting observation. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, how much growth? So we asked them, you know, basically a lot, a little or none, you know, and the blue piece of the pie here are the folks who said no growth. Everybody else is some level of growth uh, with the purple being significant and um, that sort of orangey salmon color there um, being modest. Um, so we, you know, we, we were just again, affirming these assumptions and getting a sense of what people um, think they, uh, that they might prefer. Go ahead, Jeremy. This was one of those questions that sort of tested how people, their knowledge or, or their, their intuition about how difficult is it to find a home in the community. So the, um, the idea that uh, the charts here, the big blue lines, the, the lines that are to the left of the five series, those are, those are very difficult. And so across the bottom, we talked about active seniors, first time home buyers, people who want to rent, people who have disabilities, and then low income and moderate income folks. And so overall, people seem to have a fairly good understanding that kind of no matter who you are, it's really difficult to find a home in South Kingstown. And that is the truth. It's a very hot housing market. Um, like so many communities in Massachusetts. And so people tended to have a fairly good sense of that difficulty. Go ahead, Jeremy. And then to the visual preference. Um, so we looked village by village, uh, just as Jeremy had done in Wakefield, and we said, which is appropriate? Um, and, you know, no surprise, everybody loves cottages. They're so cute. They're like little puppy houses. Um, they're sort of the gateway, as Jeremy calls them, to missing middle homes. Um, everybody loved the idea of having some cottages there. Um, but generally, you know, in the village of Wakefield was where this uh, question was focused. Their most urban village that they have, the most densely developed village. Um, they were open to all, all types of things. And this did vary from village to village. Go ahead, Jeremy. And then we wanted to ask maybe some more challenging questions, like what were your concerns about it? So we asked them if they thought that increased housing diversity would stress the schools, would it stress the public services, uh, would it cause more crime, uh, would it be unattractive and have, uh, you know, sort of effects on the character of my neighborhood, would it create a lot of noise and traffic and nuisance, um, and it, or would it negatively affect the property value. Um, so these were really interesting uh, answers to get. And probably the most surprising is at that far left is where, um, you know, very small number of folks thinking that this was gonna stress the school system because as folks who are involved in housing, a lot of you know that that's sort of like one of the, the first things that sort of comes out of the gate um, from, from folks who are opposed or, or very concerned about increasing density in their communities. What's it gonna to do to our school system? Um, and it was interesting to see in those who uh, responded to the survey that this was not a major concern. Next one. And then we flipped and sort of said, you know, what are you, exciting, what are you excited about? Um, so do you think this is gonna make the schools better? Do you think this is gonna revitalize the villages in, uh, in terms of the economy and the vibrancy? Um, do you think it's going to make it easier for folks to um, age in place in the community, uh, easier for folks to find housing opportunity in a mixed environment? Um, so, you know, this was fairly consistent across the board, um, but a lot of folks here are very supportive. Now, you know, some of you will probably ask, well, how many people answered this survey in the, in the community? And it wasn't, it was, you know, it was about 400 folks so it wasn't huge. We would have loved to have at least doubled that, but it was nothing to sneeze at either. And, you know, this kind of survey that shows some of these opinions um, that, that are supportive, um, and in some cases dramatically supportive of um, housing diversity, this was really great for us to have as um, not only for our own confidence 
um, continuing to go into public discussions, um, but also just to, to document this. Like it was great to be able to report this back to the community and say, you know, a, a lot of folks are really supportive of this. I mean, how many public meetings have you been to? And you say, geez, I wish the people who supported this came because the people who didn't, they certainly showed up and there was no counterbalance. This type of material, this type of feedback um, really helps to set that up, that counterbalance as we move forward through this. Go ahead, Jeremy. And so then we got, you know, we get into it a bit here. And so what, when we have the, the homework done, when we have the survey done, as we continue to develop the website, as we continue to put this public education material out there, you know, this is when we sort of bring Jeremy and his team, you know, deep into this and start developing these cut sheets, you know, for different types of housing. And as I say in the margin here, um, you really got to get these right. Um, this is a tough part of the project. When you're going to start talking about form, you're going to start talking about height, you're going to start talking about roof pitch and all of these different things, because this is what's going to go into your zoning. And so if these types of analyses, these sort of pre-zoning analytical exercises are done well and they're done right, then the zoning sort of writes itself and it moves through pretty quickly. If there's a, if there's a glitch or a hang up, even on one of these numbers, you've all seen it, um, you know, that can really sort of grind things down a little bit as you're trying to go through the public hearing process. So this is a really important piece. And this is kind of where we are in the project now is, you know, kind of making sure we've got all of these correct. Um, and we have, you know, started crafting some zoning for them going forward. Next, please, Jeremy. So just some takeaways. Next slide, please, Jeremy. Some pitfalls and zoning tips. Um, some things that are not on this slide that I think all of you or many of you are familiar with is, you know, and you've, you've heard about it probably in other presentations, you know, stay away from the, you know, lot by lot open space requirements and, you know, some of the really bad floor to area ratios, I think that we're all, um, that we're all used to. But on the slide here, are just some sort of things that were on my mind in terms of recent, you know, developments or things that I've think, been thinking about more recently. Um, getting back to, you know, to Massachusetts, remember that 40R is an overlay um, and it's by rights. These are some really fundamental, important things because, um, you know, we have been involved in projects where, you know, there, there's a strong call to replace the base zoning. And that can be a really good thing. But if somebody comes in and then says, well, we, we want to, uh, yeah, and then, and then we're going to do 40R, well, now you've got, you've got a, an issue. You know, both of those are viable, but just make sure people know that 40 R is an overlay and that it's by right. So you're getting away from that special permit process. A lot of folks, you know, like to, the special permit makes them more comfortable. Um, we gotta get out of that and get people out of their com comfort zone and go to the by right. Don't forget the compliance and the eligibility numbers. Again, you know, we present a lot of this in terms of form and massing and visualization, but you've got to reach those eight, 12 and 20 units per acre thresholds if you're going to be using 40R or, or other similar tools. Get buy-in on the height. Um, this, this is really an important place um, where people get hung up. Um, and it's amazing, it's a domino. If you can't get buy-in on the height, then a lot of this stuff falls apart um, because the types of forms and the types of housing and the missing middle options that maybe Jeremy and his team have spent a full year educating people on, if they can't get the right height, um, it's just not going to work. Um, and that's something for some reason a lot of communities have a hang up on that. So make sure that is on the table early and people know that it's something that's subject to change. Um, probably time for us all to get past age restrictions um, on a lot of this. This is another sort of comfort blanket um, that communities like to use, uh, especially those who are afraid of those, you know, toxic school children that are gonna ruin everything. 
um, they want the age restrictions to go with it. This is not to say we shouldn't be building homes for people to age in place and, you know, the aging uh, population in our communities. Of course we should. We just don't need to restrict housing to that um, unless there's really a special need that's specifically identified. Um, parking, uh, just say it with confidence. Don't be afraid to say it when you go out there. Yes, there are families who only have one car. There's a lot of families who only want one car. There's a lot of families who don't want any cars. This can be a really difficult sort of cultural thing for folks on a planning board to get past. Um, they just, it, it's, it's, it's foreign. I, I don't understand how it's possible for somebody to have a couple of kids and, you know, not have two cars to go with that. Um, so really make sure that, you know, you, you speak that with, with confidence. And as I mentioned, um, cottage communities is a little tip here. This, if people gravitate to that, then start there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a winner. Um, it's a great development type. It's a great development model. Um, and so if that's some place where you feel like people are gravitating to, we've seen it a lot, um, start there and, and, and get things going. Next slide, please, Jeremy. So here are some resources. These are things that you can just uh, look at. Um, but if you are interested in that South Kingstown case study, um, the third resource here is their Homestyle website. Um, so you can get a look at some of that messaging that I was talking about and some of the materials that Union Studio has put together for this. Um, so um, next slide. Yeah, but before we advance, I'll just point out too, I, I included here the cover of Missing Middle Housing. This is the, yeah. the book that was written by Dan Parolik and his firm Opticos. Um, it's a great resource if you're interested in these sorts of things. It covers, you know, the history of these issues, the demographics of these issues, the types themselves. It talks about regulatory issues and barriers and things to make sure and tackle and address. So if, if this idea resonates with you, that's a great resource. You know, it's a $40 book online and it's got a, a lot of great content in it for, for more information. Thanks, Jeremy. I don't get a cut of the proceeds or anything either. <laughs> All right, I think that That's is it. it. Thank you, Jeremy and, and Nate. That was so informative. And I feel like some of the questions that came through, you've already answered, especially around community engagement and how to start a dialogue around density and, and doing messaging around density. Um, one of the questions that we hear a lot is, how do you actually achieve density in areas where there is no water sewer? Can you talk a little bit more about, for example, um, 10 units per acre, what have communities done to support that kind of density with only septic? Um, I, I'll start with that. It's it's a it's a challenge, right? It's, um, it, it's clearly uh, an issue, um, can be costly. And, you know, my feeling is, is that, you know, someone needs to step up to the plate and help the developers out with that. Um, I mean, some developers can, can handle it, um, uh, but not all, um, certainly. But um, build, building a package sewer system, a neighborhood scale sewer system is usually the path of least resistance there. Obviously every site is different and there are different opportunities, um, but from a permitting perspective and those types of things, that's usually the, the avenue that you're gonna see folks go down um, with this. So for example, it'd be easier to have individual wells and a packaged sewage treatment plant um, than the opposite from, from a permitting perspective. Uh, but it's upfront money, um, you know, these things uh, costing, you know, several hundred thousand dollars uh, to a million dollars, uh, depending on the scale of development that you're that you're talking about. Um, but I think partnerships are required. Um, and you know, one of the as a Rhode Island resident, um, I'm always uh, jealous of you know all the things that organizations like Mass Development do. And um, you know, there, there's there's more money in Massachusetts, is what it comes down to. And there are organizations um, at the state level. Um, maybe there are, um, you know, tax treaties that can be uh, negotiated at the local level to help with some of those upfront costs. Um, but um, yeah, I think being creative, 
looking for funding sources that I think exist um, is probably what needs to happen. And, and I would just add that I'm the guy that should be talking about septic, but you know, certainly if septic is, is creating a limitation that, that might be limiting your density, but that's not to suggest that you couldn't still utilize some of these types maybe as a means of utilizing half as much land, right? If, if you're held to a certain number of units, that doesn't mean you have to distribute those over an entire parcel or site. So you might be able to limit site disturbance, limit the amount of infrastructure you need to build. So even with that as a limitation on the quote density, you could still utilize some of these strategies as a, main, as a means of consolidating the development in a way that might have other benefits. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Tingsboro. Uh, for those of us that are planners and not architects, can you get more specific to help us get a sen general sense on what minimum heights are important for various forms? So I don't know that there's a sort of simple answer. Right off the top of your head, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, it, it's funny. One of the conversations I've had with me a couple of times is, wouldn't it be great if instead of regulating height by dimension, we could just regulate height by number of stories, because in some ways that at the end of the day is what people are thinking about. So if you said, instead of saying 25 feet, and you think that shorthand for two stories in a pitched roof, you know, or, or worse, a lot of these types, you know, one of the clever things that we used to do was build into our attic space. And so the half story was a clever way of grabbing additional area without necessarily adding an entire floor to the building. But it gets very difficult for people to envision how to talk about half stories, <clears throat> especially in a very simple building height calculation. So, you know, at the end of the day, it is probably fair to assume that it's, you know, 10 feet per floor. So if you want a two-story building, it's 20 feet. But you got to really think about the roof forms, too. I think a lot of the traditional forms that people aspire to for the, for the new construction, potentially, you know, the roof pitch itself can be fairly significant. And you don't want the roof heights, the dimensions themselves, to start to suggest that someone has to build stuff that sort of the absolute minimums of, of pitches and things like that just to be able to achieve. So I think the other conversation around building height just has to do with number of floors and what you allow. So, you know, Nate and I have also had conversations about, you know, if you're, if you're promoting multifamily or promoting mixed use, but are limiting them at two stories, that generally doesn't pencil out. You really need to allow them three or even four stories. You know, anything above that starts to get a little bit out of scale and, and starts to require different set, setups and systems like elevators and stuff in any case. But just, just recognizing that um, you might want to build in some flexibility and maybe not assume the worst. Don't assume that it just because you go to 35 feet that someone's going someone's to try to squeeze something in there or say 35 feet and two stories so that they understand you're trying to build in a little flexibility for how the two stories are done, but you're not sort of constraining the design unnecessarily or, or unintentionally with the heights. I mean, I know that, that I was surprised um, at how tall some of the cottages were that were coming out of Jeremy's shop. You know, I just didn't expect it. And, um, and it was because of those, you know, those roof forms, um, you know, high pitch, um, you know, created a, just a tall crown on, on the building. And so um, it was important that we looked at that. I think this, this idea of a more form-based approach in achieving some of this middle missing middle housing types is really important. And there was a question about uh, how many communities there are in Massachusetts that are using form-based zoning. And, and further, what is the best way for communities to start thinking about a more form-based zoning and, and encouraging, or I guess, hand-holding communities to think beyond the confines of zoning? Do you have any advice around that? I don't know how many folks are doing it, I guess, to, to, to start that off. Um, I, I think it's, I, I've heard stories here and there of more form-based approaches in, in different communities. Some of you have probably seen the great work that's been done in Somerville, uh, but that was more about solving non-conformities. Um, and there's a lot of hybrid work, um, you know, out there. So, you know, some of the stuff that Jeremy and I work on is, um, you know, it's, it's not form-based, but there are design standards. Um, and those are sort of easier to uh, wedge into the, the zoning bylaws that are just more common. Um, you know, going to a more pure form-based approach um, is certainly possible, but the, the way to do it most easily is probably within the confines of a district. 
So if you're mm -hmm. creating a new district downtown um, and it's sort of self-contained within the bylaw, um, that would be easier than to just do a sort of a completely di different approach with the street frontages and the, the forms of the buildings and all of those things. Um, you could certainly take care of it that way more easily um, than trying to intersperse it through all the, the, you know, square peg round hole type thing uh, with the conventional bylaw. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, when they first came about, they really were meant to address new developments where maybe a developer didn't want to necessarily design everything that was going to go in there so they could start talking about it in those terms. But they can be really effective too, even for existing communities and how you retrofit things. It really just does put a lot of importance on really analyzing the existing context as, so that you're using the existing, at least the, the parts of the existing context that you are looking to replicate, right? There might be stuff that you're not such a big fan of, but the parts that you are excited about or that resonate with the community, you need to do your homework and really kind of get out and, and do the measurements and use those as the basis for those, those sorts of uh, regulations. Advice. And we had a question earlier from Alyssa who is interested in knowing what communities have adopted cottage housing zoning. Um, if, if anyone would like to connect with her, please message her privately, but I wonder if Jeremy and Nate know of some good examples in Massachusetts. I don't know of a Massachusetts example. Um, I mean, there are cottage communities that have been built, um, but I don't know that uh, they were probably built using a comprehensive permit. Um, I don't know that they were built um, with a zoning amendment. Yeah, and I think, I don't know specific towns, but I am aware that there are towns that are tackling the issue. But obviously, as Nate's been pointing out, these things can take some time, especially agreeing to some of the standards and such. So I know that, I know there are communities that are starting to try to address this and, and, and include it. Um, in the Northwest, there's a little bit more of a history on these sorts of things. There are communities out in the Pacific Northwest that have some, you know, cottage bylaws in place to, to sort of promote and allow for that sort of development. Or certainly that was the first one we tackled in South Kingstown. I don't know that it's been approved yet, but like Nate said, the thought was that that was probably the lowest hanging fruit for people to kind of wrap their heads around and accept. And so the thought was to maybe put that one sort of in advance of moving on to some of the other types. But um, yeah, I, I would say you're, you're probably going to more success looking in like the Pacific Northwest for a few examples of ones that have already been adopted, but I do know they are underway in a number of places. And Christine, if I can just jump in, this is Laura. Um, I think the development, I think it's called River's Edge or something like that in Concord, I think they have a cottage development um, because they didn't do it under a 40B, they did it under special um, special permit and I think they used um, a cottage um, development. And also the 40R starter home um, legislation mm -hmm. kind of, you know, leans more towards a, a cottage development um, type of, of uh, zoning. So I, I would look at those two examples. I, I think, Christine, can I do? Uh, yeah, go ahead, oh, Katie. Jump in with a question. Um, sure. I'm intrigued with um, someone asked a very specific question. Uh, does a duplex in the same form as a single family house pencil out for a developer in terms of? Uh, it just said, does it pencil out? And I think that's, a, that's always an interesting question um, as a buildable form. Well, I mean, it's gonna depend on the market. Um, yeah. I mean, the answer certainly could be yes. Um, um, and then is it, is it gonna be rental or is it gonna be ownership? Um, what, I, what I can say is that when it's ownership, um, we, you know, in, when we started looking at these issues maybe 10 years ago, we were a little surprised at how much these units were selling for. Right. Um, so, um, you know, we were thinking, oh, yay, we're going to really drop the price on a lot of these stuff. Oh, maybe not so much. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that um, I think they are penciling out by and large. Um, I don't. I don't think that things are dropping significantly in terms of price points. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, when you're talking about a duplex, um, but um, I'm, I'm sure. I, I would. I would think 
with great confidence that they would be penciling out. Okay. One more question I wanted to ask real quick is that some real down and dirty about building height. A lot of talk about how public safety and fire engines and ladder heights are dic what dictates height. And how does that actually work with multifamily? Yeah, no, that you're absolutely right. And that becomes one of the, the main drivers and typically is one of the key conversations we have in the process, certainly of any you know, development project we have is you've got to talk it through with the fire chief, make sure that it's you know meeting whatever requirements they have. It can vary um, you know, district to district based on the sorts of equipment they have. There are certainly certain rules of thumbs, but we have a project right now in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the local the fire chief is saying he anything he won't do anything over 30 feet. And so we've been working really hard to try to figure out how to make that work, even for a three-story building, you know, 30 feet to the eave. You know, it sounds like a slam dunk, but it can actually be a little bit of a challenge if you want to do you know, some slightly nicer units. You actually have a little topography on site that's going to push you over that in certain locations. So um, absolutely. It's, you know, I think with, with, with any regulation, right, it, it's a, it's an overlaid thing. There are multiple regulations that need to be addressed. And so I know one of the things Nate often talks about is if you know, it's already covered somewhere else, you don't necessarily need to overregulate by also putting it in the zone. And so that's not to say there's no building height requirements, but I think you can still regulate for sort of the forms and things that you're going after. And then there are always strategies for things like fire regulations. It maybe means you have to sprinkler it when you weren't going to sprinkler it, or maybe talking through with the local fire marshal. It's just putting in another hydrant. You know, sometimes these things can be negotiations and should be talked through. But absolutely, I mean, there, there are other regulations out there that that, that are going to inform some of those things as well. But usually, the sort the scale of things we're talking about generally are within that range, unless you're talking about some of those larger multifamily types and you're starting to get into three and a half, four stories. Then you're yes. You need to be careful about some of those issues as well. If Christine and Laura don't have any more questions, there just was one more that intrigued me. Um, the, the pros and cons of design guidelines versus form-based zoning and zone, and you know what are potential pitfalls with design guidelines, even if they may be easier to pass. Uh, Jeremy knows that I could keep you here until 6.30 talking about this, this question. Um, you know, design guidelines, I mean, I'll try to be quickly, be quick about it. Um, I think the major advantage to a form-based code is that it codifies um, these items. Um, design guidelines um, are a tool for negotiation, really. Um, they're not code. Um, they are wish list. Um, and they can be effective. It's not to say that they can't be effective. A lot of communities use them very effectively. Um, but if push comes to shove, um, design guidelines are not going to, you know, you're, the town's not going to win that argument. Um, they're very helpful to provide an illustration of like, this is what this legal language means. Um, here's a picture of it. Okay, I see what you're saying, right? So th that's where design guidelines are great. Um, they do a great job of sort of, you know, being the picture that's worth a thousand words. Um, but in a, in a, they're not legally enforceable. Um, you know, that's usually how they're used. Um, if the standards are in the body of the bylaw, they are legally enforceable. Um, and, you know, I will also say this, that a form-based approach does a better job with by right, because if you're permitting by right, you want to know what you're getting. And that's one of the things that form based does really well. You know what you're getting. Um, if you're permitting by special permit, then, you know, you can have a discussion about it and you can have your design guidelines um, and that can all be a discretionary process. Um, but if you want to move this along and if you want to be pro housing and, you know, get these things built, um, doing it with by right, then having those standards within the body of the bylaw is um, what's going to get you there. Well, we are at the end of our day here. Um, Jeremy, Nate, I, we can't thank you enough. Um, so many great positive comments about this. Uh, oh, so I really, really you. appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. And you tied it, you managed to tie in the points of the first two sessions into really concrete examples in our Massachusetts town. So I, I so appreciate that. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.
Take care. Thanks a lot. And goodbye, everyone. Um, we are we will be here next next on the 17th at one o'clock once again. Um, we'll send out the link again and um, we hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you.